Aha, hvala. Dobar dan. Nadam se da smo spremni za početak današnje radionice. Vidim mnogo poznata lica ovde, svima pozdrav u ime Prirodne komore Srbije i Udruženja za stočarstvo i prirodo stočarskih proizvoda. Ovo je nastavak jednog velikog projekta koji, ja mislim, od 2019. traje javno zdravlje, dobrobit životinja, vrlo značajne teme. Svi koji su u ovom biznisu na bilo koji način znaju da je važno ne samo zbog pristupanja Evropskoj uniji, zbog neke Evropske unije, da tako kažem, već zbog samog našeg poslovanja u Srbiji, u našem stočarstvu koje je na vrlo klimovim nogama i ne kažem da će ovaj projekat da ga uspostavi na dobru poziciju, ali sigurno da je to jedan od činilaca koje treba ostvariti. Prirodna komora Srbije je prepoznala značaj, naravno, i udruženje za stočarstvo i predostočarskih proizvoda, tako da smo sa kolegama iz Ministarstva pojoprivode šumarstva i pojoprivode, odnosno Uprave za veterinu, dogovorili da nastavak bude kroz četiri radionice, po projektu je to sigurno planirano, ja sad ne znam detalje, iskreno da kažem, ali ove četiri radionice da se realizuju kroz regionalne prirodne komore, kroz naše kancelarije. Mi smo to tehnički naravno podržali, malo smo i objedinili da ne bude baš sam region, nego danas imamo novi sad kao centar događanja, ali tu je Sremska Mitrovica i Zrenjanin, naravno. No, to je naša neka organizacija. Mišljim da je dobro, juče smo bili u Kruševcu, ja sam delimično bio prisutan, iskreno rečeno, i mislim da je izuzetno zanimljivo, da ne kažem, vrlo stručno i vrlo konkretno. Imamo još dve radionice koje će se održati sutra i u Subotici i u petak u Zaječaru i to je za ovaj korak, što se kaže, nastavljamo našu saradnju sa kolegama iz Uprave za veterinu, ne samo po ovom projektu, nego inače. I želim vam uspešan rad, iskoristite prisutstvo naših eksperata koji je za sva dodatna pitanja, za sva pojašnjenja. Mislim da imamo jednu odličnu ekipu za ovakvu vrstu radionice. Hvala na dolazku, na odvojenom vremenu i, kažem, iskoristite na najbolji način. Izvoli, Maja. Hvala. Pozdravljam vas ispred Ministarstva poljoprivrede, šumarstva i vodoprivrede, Uprave za veterinu i, naravno, ispred projekta tehničke pomoći, zdravlje životinja i dobrobiti. Ovaj projekat je veoma značajan za Srbiju zato što nam pomaže i daje impute kako ćemo dalje, kako ćemo što se tiče i zdravlja i dobrobiti životinja, šta nam je činiti, pomaže nam da naše zakonodavstvo popravimo, da ga implementiramo i da širimo svest konkretno u ovom slučaju dobrobiti životinja i ove radionice jesu koncipirane tako da što više pričamo o toj dobrobiti životinja, o značaju dobrobiti životinja i kako to kao proizvodjači da postignemo. I zašto nam je to važno? Hvala vam što ste došli, zato što znam da je vaše vreme dragoceno i vreme svih nas i da nekako uvek kada su neke radionice, konferencije i bilo kako okupljanja koje se dešavaju, jako je teško ljude odvojiti od svakodnevnog posla. Ali ja se nadam da ćete danas sa ove radionice, sa ovog skupa otići sa jednim 
iskustvom više, sa jednim znanjem više i tako da budete uvereni da vam nije dan, da vam neće dan proći uzalud. Posebno što su tu sa nama stručnjaci koji su zaista stručnjaci u svojoj oblasti i hvala na tome što su izabrani da rade na ovom projektu. Ovo je samo jedan segment koji oni obavljaju u Srbiji. Antonio, kad se bude predstavljao, predstavit će i projekat. Tako da ja neću dalje, neću da oduzimam vreme. Naš ključni ekspert će vam o tome sve pričati detaljnije, a ja vas ujedno pozivam, ako mogu da zloupotrebim ovaj skup, da dođete na sajem poljoprivrede mi u četvrtak 26. 26. maja. Takođe imamo jednu konferenciju, mislim da traje sat i po, tako, nije dugo, gde će biti takođe dobrih tema, pričat ćemo o afričkoj kuge svinja, pričat ćemo koliko je značajno dobro biti za proizvođača, odnosno ne samo proizvođača farmskih životinja, uopšte za celokupnu industriju i za biosigurnostne mere, tako da ako u četvrtak imate vremena i dolazite na sajam poljoprivrede, posetite master halu gde ćemo imati... Dan stočara, da. Sad gospodin Antonio Dinardo preuzima palicu, a ja prelazim da slušam i gledam. Hvala. Ok, thank you Maja, thank you very much. As Maja said, my name is Antonio Dinardo, I'm a veterinarian by training. I'm ecoing. Um, I work for the State Veterinary Service into the Animal Welfare Department. I used to be a researcher, and now I'm here in this project as a key expert in animal welfare. Um, of course, I do thank the commerce, uh, the Chamber of Commerce of, uh, of Serbia for organizing Bing. I do thank Maya Andriasevic for the help and the support that she always gave it to me. And um, before any further ado, and I mean, I don't know how many, I need to know, I, I really want to know, to interact with you. I would like to know how many of you, please raise your hand, are veterinarians? One, two, three, four. How many of you coming from industry, like meat industry, eggs? Well, what kind of industry? industry oh meat industry that's very good uh other people are inspectors like or can you tell me your profile like your interest inspectors uh, veterinarians okay mostly veterinarians so do you understand our language i mean we were talking about animal welfare so I was very concerned about that. Um, Maya said already introduced our project, which is a technical assistance project for enforcement of animal health and welfare. Uh, this project has already produced some stuff. You will see some brochures and leaflet on, on, in, on the entrance, and mainly on biosecurity, on uh, animal health. And we are producing animal welfare stuff. Very soon will be out uh, some new material, brand new. We are working on that for the final revision. As you know, animal welfare is a very delicate issue and has to be dealt with very, very uh, sensitive. Um, the overall object of the project is to assist the country authorities in harmonization on, uh, for the full implementation of the ACWIS, the legislation. Uh, within two steps to support the process of harmonization and legislation with EU legislation in area of animal health and welfare, to ensure appropriate awareness of all stakeholders and public, so all of you, to disseminate information and improve communication with all the relevant stakeholders, and to strengthen 
the institutional and administrative capacities of competent authorities. So you can see that the beneficiaries is the Ministry of, uh, of Agriculture, uh, Water and Forestry Management, represented by Maya here. Uh, the, the, um, as, as Nenad said just before, the, the project started in 19, in June um, 19. It was supposed to, to last 24 months, but then we had this problem uh, everywhere. So we had to slow down our operation because of the COVID. So we had an extension. First one was up to 9th of June uh, 2021. We were supposed to finish. So we had a new extension only here and a half, so we will be finished by 9 December 2022. The project is divided in some results. Uh, we're gonna have a result one, reinforced animal welfare standards. We in uh, the result, result two, and, and something that I'm very much keen on it, is enhances capacities for stray dog population management. I know this is a huge problem, uh, how many of you are from municipalities? Any of you represent municipalities like commune? Uh, no? See? Municipalities? Yeah. You are. You represent. No. Any of you are here because of the, are members of the municipalities, like are invited for, some, for the municipalities? Yeah. Okay. Um, result three is strengthening administrative and structural capacities for animal welfare. Four is reinforcing animal disease control policy. And uh, result five is about biosecurity of animal holdings. Uh, today we will be talking about animal welfare because as I said, I'm uh, the expert here are also uh, only animal welfare expert if we know something about other things. And um, what we will be going to do on animal welfare is we did the amendments of the current law on animal welfare, uh, the, the Serbian one, which is under revision. And we produce drafts of rule book for the minimum standard for the protection of calves uh, during rearing and fattening, pigs, laying hands, chickens kept for meat production, and animals bred for cat farming purposes. Uh, the project has been producing some manuals and uh, uh, standard operational procedures that will be in line with the ISO uh, legislation, the, namely is the ISO TS34700. Uh, it's a very broad and, and general uh, legislation and we will be dealing about on transport and uh, slaughter of animals and these are two chapters that are very very important we already did some seminars on transport and slaughter and we will be dealing also uh, the cop sops will be on animals bred for kept fun purposes we are producing uh, and we are giving uh, regional seminars and this is this is one of those and we will be doing a national conference. And I, I may uh, say that um, uh, in July, we are planning to have a national Congress on animal welfare in Beograd. So all of you are invited. We will be the right place in the right time. All stakeholders will be invited, plenty of people, hopefully. And uh, we're gonna have uh, a national conference on animal welfare in Beograd. And it's gonna be, if I'm not wrong, on the 8th of uh, July. So fix this date, please come, come along and, uh, and we'll see you there. I'm pretty much sure about that. Uh, we are doing also education and training in schools. We are, we are cooperating with the University of Beograd, uh, Faculty of Veterinary Sciences. Uh, in two weeks time, we're gonna have a workshop with students uh, on animal welfare. Uh, in two days, in one day, we will be talking about the stray dog population issue, which is a big thing in Serbia. And uh, the following day, we will be discussing with students and professors of the university, we will be discussing uh, animal welfare in farm animal. So uh, the seminar will be, we today will be mainly talking about, I will be saying the point of view of European community, the point of view uh, of, uh, the result of some, of some uh, uh, surveys on animal welfare 
while uh, Tony Dalmau, my colleague, is a senior expert in animal welfare, is a fine scientist, and uh, he works for IRTA, which is Instituto uh, per la Ricerca e la Tecnologia Alimentare in Monels, in uh, Catalunya, Provincia Autonoma della Spagna, in not Spagna. <laughs> Maybe one day it will be something different. <laughs> Is Catalano, is not Spanish, and uh, is also Spanish, and uh, is a very fine. You will find out. I mean, is is a very talented guy in in giving talks. He's a, a fine researcher. He has been into research in animal welfare all his life. While I do work more into like legislation and into the field work as a state veterinary veterinarian. So this is my beautiful city. So uh, we go for the first. Uh, presentation is going to be mine. We'll say something in general about the animal welfare uh, in the modern society. I have to do this first, and then how can you do that? Alexa. Hold on. Uh, I need to. Zoom. So, uh, inter. Condivido. Okay. But I have to. What? What if I do this? Does it work? No, they're not, not going to work. Is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it work? Works? It works. Oh, it doesn't work in Zoom. Oh, you're right. Sorry, we are, we are online in Zoom. Oh, yeah. It so. works, but it doesn't work for Zoom. Stop. Lost. Oh, this one. Okay. okay. These young guys are marvelous. They are very good at it. Uh, okay, hope it works. It works. So we're going to say some words about the animal welfare in the in the modern society. Um, everything came out from the Lisbon Treaty, where the animals were recognized finally back in two thousand nine as uh, sentient beings, and we should pay full regards to the welfare of these animals. And this is very important. I mean. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty has been accepted by mainly all the countries in the world, mainly. So there are no countries that have accepted the treaty. And, uh, and so this where all it started uh, conventionally. And uh, we had, uh, if we go a little bit of history, then Tony will say much more about this in details. But anyway, start from the five freedoms. I, I, I believe that all of you have been heard about the freedom, the five freedoms law that turned into what is now called the five domains. And uh, again, Tony will say, we go into detail and we'll explain to you what is this about. I can say that uh, the EU relevant legislation on animal welfare at the moment is uh, the Council Directive 9858 on the protection of animals kept for farming, uh, Directive 9974 for the minimum standards for the protection of laying hands, uh, Directive 43 2007 on the protection of chickens for meat production. Uh, Directive 119 on the protection of calves. Directive 120 on the protection of, of pigs. And uh, very important regulation 2005, the one of 2005, which is the animals, the protection of animals during transport. And I'm, I, I, I will anticipate now there is a big debate in the European Union about, about changing this legislation because this legislation seems not to be enough to protect the animals during transport. There's a huge, a, a huge movement of people and the public opinion saying that, I mean, we should change the legislation because the animal welfare of animal transported for long distances is very much impaired, especially in uh, harsh condition in summer, 
and in very uh, cold condition during winter. I mean, you know how big is the European Union and you can go from Latvia or Finland down to the border of Turkey and can be any sort of condition. And so there's a public demand of changing the legislation. Um, the least but not last is the Council Regulation uh, 1099, which is about the slaughter of killing. This is a very, very, very important regulation as well. And the regulation, as you may know, uh, there are some derogation on religious slaughtering. I don't know if you have ever, ever heard about the religious slaughtering. I'm talking about the Jewish, the halal, uh, the halal and the, which is a Muslim and the kosher uh, Jewish ritual uh, killing. And um, you, I don't know if you know it, but the animals before killing, they should be stunned. They should lose consciences before being jugulated. And according to the religion the belief in halal for Muslim and in the kosher for Jewish, the animals, when they are jugulated, they have to be conscient. So this is a, a, a big problem, a big welfare problem. And there's a huge debate in in Europe, whether or not prohibiting or not. And Tony knows a lot about that. And uh, there are some form of way to go around this problem. But nevertheless, if you go to a slaughterhouse and you see how the halal and the kosher slaughtering uh, system is performed, is very shocking. I mean, these animals are completely conscious and they are, the, the, the throat is cut like that. Now there are some, some things is changing, but still there's a derogation in the legislation. Um, going back to legislation, the animal welfare, uh, the, um, the European Union has set up some uh, uh, European Center for Animal Welfare. In 2018, they set this, uh, uh, this center on animal welfare in pigs, um, led by Wageningen Institute in Netherlands and the FLI in Germany and the Harus University in Denmark. In October 2019 uh, was founded in another reference center dedicated to poultry and other small farmed animals and uh, um, is um, Agencia Nacional de Sécurité Sanitaire de l'Alimentation in France is leading that the, the, um, the center. Uh, the Institute of Woodbirds have something in Denmark and Instituto Zoprofilattico Sperimentale della Lombardia e dell'Emilia Romagna, which is also a partner in this project, in giving this project. And uh, uh, of course, IRTA, uh, Instituto de Ricerca e Tecnologia Agroalimentare della Spagna, where uh, Tony belongs to. Uh, just recently, last year, it was founded a new EU Reference Center for Animal Welfare, this time on um, uh, ruminants and equines protection, uh, consortium of the flea in Sweden, uh, Austria, uh, the Hellenicos Georgis Organismos Dimitra in Greece, uh, the National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment in France, the College, the University of Ireland, and finally, the Instituto Zoprofilattico Sperimentale dell'Abruzzo e del Molise, I'm very proud because I belong to that. And Abruzzo is my region. And so I'm happy that they are, even if I don't work anymore for them, and I work for the State Veterinary Service, I used to do being a researcher in that institute. I'm very happy that they managed to be part of this reference center in there. As you can see, these are the milestones in this graph. You can see um, we achieved is a long process that uh, from step by step, step by step, we've been uh, reaching goals, but there's still a lot to go. Uh, we've been through mistakes. We had to re rethink uh, our animal welfare legislation. We had to face what the public was saying and were asking. Uh, very loudly, they were asking to change and we, we had to accept it because this is the way the European Union works. I mean, public opinion counts and we have to think, to, to listen to them. That's why we do. Uh, OIE is the, the, the equivalent of l'Office International de CPCZ based in Paris, in France, is the World Organization for Animal Health. I think you, 
you all of you may ha have heard about it. And it's um, the equivalent of the World Health Organization, WHO, but it's for the animals, uh, for, the, for the animal health. Uh, the OIS produced a huge book, which is the Terrestrial Code. And in the Terrestrial Code, there is a, a chapter dedicated to animal welfare. Uh, in May 2017, uh, OIE stated uh, like the vision uh, of, on animal welfare. And this is, you have to think that OIE is, is not an European organization, is a worldwide organization. So they have representatives in Africa, in Asia, in uh, South and North America. So it's something very important that uh, after dealing with very important disease like rinderpest, like Violo, like uh, foot mouth diseases, they are huge problem for livestock production in the world. OIE realized that animal welfare is a topic that has to be dealt with in, in the whole world. So they stated the, their vision that saying that the world where the welfare of animals is respected, promoted and advanced in ways that complement the pursuit of animal health, human well-being, socioeconomic development and environmental sustainability. So this is very important. Uh, to understand how far we went to animal welfare. I remember when I was, uh, I'm nearly 60, and, and when I was my younger vet, uh, was a, animal welfare for me was kind of strange things, like uh, animalist things, and was not very much, that much important. In time, things have changed a lot, uh, and now there's a, a public concern about the animal welfare, and, and it, it is globally, it's a globally concern. It's not, it's not European and you have to accept this, like it or not like it. I mean, animal welfare is something very, very important. I mean, on a daily basis, I have to deal much more on animal welfare issues than on animal, animal health issues. And this is what it is. And this is what is gonna be happening in the future. More and more we will be involved into animal welfare problems, into animal welfare prosecution, we go to the to the court. And so it's very, very important understanding and uh, uh, and fixing threshold and fixing limit, preparing good legislation. And with the help of science, with the help of guys like him, we will be, you know, we will be better understanding what animal welfare is, what are the feelings of the animals. And Tony will say much more about that. And uh, as I was saying in the terrestrial animal health code, in the section seven, uh, we have chapter on the general chapter 7.1 on in, it is a general chapter on recommendation on animal welfare and chapter 7.2 is about transport of animals by sea, three by land, four by hair. Uh, chapter 7.5 is about the slaughter of animals, very important. 7.6 is the killing of animals for disease control purposes. And you know what we're talking about because uh, I was in England when I did the 2001 FMD, foot and mouth disease, and we had to kill so many animals that is something that I will remember all my life. I mean, some, I was living there for six months and it's crazy. You know what avian influenza is? What is the problem with birds? You know what problem we have with African swine fever? How many problems we could have with, uh, with um, um, endemic and epidemic disease? I know that opinion now is diverted into coronavirus because coronavirus is something for humans and it's very a huge problem, but we don't have to forget. I mean, we are vets and we are, we are dealing with diseases and we got problem on that. Uh, so the chapter 7.6 of the terrestrial animal code is about the disease for control purposes. Chapter 7.7 .7 is about stray dog population control. Again, uh, OIE is set a chapter on, on the stray dog population control, just to understand how important it is to deal with this problem. Of course, it's related to the rabies and the control of rabies, because we, we all know what rabies is, and it's a very dangerous disease. It's an incurable disease and for humans and uh, is, a, is a threat anyway, and it will always be a threat unless we get rid of this, this disease. Uh, so OIE dedicated and a chapter. As you can see, OA is not a fixed uh, set of argument. I mean, there will be 
adding, I mean, in time, according to the need that they have. For example, 7.8, uh, use of animals in research and education is another chapter. Uh, chapter 7.9 on beef cattle production system, 10 on broiler chicken production systems, as you can see, 11 dairy cattle production system, uh, 12 well for a working aggregate. Uh, working aggregates may be in Serbia. I'm pretty much sure that it's not a, a big important issue because you don't have many, many more as you used to have in the past. But there are still country. I saw when I, when I went to another project in Romania, for example, in Romania, they use a lot. They're still using a lot of equit for work. But you have to imagine in other continents like Asia, like Africa, like South America. I mean, there's a big welfare issue on working equits. Uh, chapter of 713 is about animal welfare and pig production system. And finally, there's a chapter that is not applied to our, our culture. I, I don't know if, I, I'm pretty much sure that in Serbia you don't eat snake, uh, but uh, there's a chapter on, on the killing of reptiles for their skin and meat. I think it's mainly focused on crocodile, crocodile killing. If you go back to animal welfare and the society, I would say that everyone, I mean, so going saying, as I said before, I mean, animal welfare is something that has to be, uh, it regards everybody in the society. It's not only, I mean, the, the stakeholders who are working inside. Uh, this is a very interesting study about the level of animal welfare and the livestock productivity. As you can see here, this is the level of animal welfare and this is the productivity. So, so the, the profitability of the animals. I know that the industry, of course, they made their own business and they want to make profit out of the production of animals. So you see, uh, after the domestication, we have an increase of animal welfare at the beginning. And then the more you produce and the more intensively you, you rear your animals, I mean, the level of animal welfare goes down, goes down, goes down, up to the point that we get here, where is, this is the level of animal welfare set by the legislation. As you can see, it's quite low and it's still low. So this means that we should go farther up to reduce a little bit of livestock productivity and get to what is... Uh, desirable or appropriate for the society, the, the good level of animal welfare. In fact, now we're gonna see, I, I will show you some result of uh, uh, online consultation uh, regarding the fitness of the legislation on animal welfare. And it was published uh, two months ago. Uh, yeah, we're in May, so it's two months ago. So quite pretty much fresh. It's a sample of respondents it's nearly 60,000 uh, respondents divided, uh, not only EU citizens, but also non-EU citizens, 4.75% uh, of the people were non-EU um, normal citizens selected by, you know, very statistical, very strict statistical criteria. Uh, business company, they work into the, uh, the world of animals, uh, 5306, non governmental organization, NGO were represented, business association in general, academic and research institution, also environmental organization, and public authorities. So, this is the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the category of the respondents of this survey. Uh, if we break up, we see the, the data by uh, country, uh, Germany was the one most, most represented, represented, France, Poland, and then you can see Italy, Sweden, Spain, and blah, 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 and going down and down. Um, the, the questionnaire was, uh, was, uh, um, was, a, was were available in 23 official language and had 13 questions, uh, four of which are concerning how the EU uh, animal welfare uh, rules are functioning in European Union. And nine questions were about the possible alternative and then the, the possibility to revise the current legislation. So let's go to the results. Uh, half of the respondent, 50%, they perceived that uh, compared to 25 years ago, 
there is a more uniform level of protection in the farm animals across EU countries. 92% uh, of the respondent, they, on the other hand, they said that the, um, the level, the, um, the animal welfare legislation did, does not ensure adequate level and uniform protection for all species in need. Half of the respondents um, perceived that uh, the common rules of animal welfare have facilitated the trade and improved competition within in, in the European market. But 66%, they also said that for the animal welfare, like the current animal welfare legislation does not ensure businesses to compete fairly across the European Union. 65% of the respondents, they felt strongly that uh, they, are not, they are not sufficiently informed about the condition under which the animal welfare are found in the EU. What does it mean? It means that uh, there is a need for the common people to understand what's going on in the farm. I mean, I know that we go in farm, we see what's going on. For us, some practices are normal, or we've been seeing these this practices since we started our profession. And it's, uh, it's very important to transfer and be trans transferred to the public opinion what it is in the farm. How do we rear the animals? I mean, even if sometimes it's hard to explain the people uh, what we're doing, uh, because some, some things are really, from a, the point of view of the men from the street, is they're not acceptable. And we, we, we can go to, to a couple of them like killing the one day old chick in the laying ants industry. Is this acceptable? I mean, there are these nice chicks. I mean, you give it for present to your kids, your things, and then you kill half of these animals in the hatchery just because they are male. They are totally useless in the production of eggs. And this is this happens every day. Millions of these chicks are killed and they are crushed into. Have you ever seen? I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen what is a crushing machine for 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 chicks, it's like something that rotates and goes crashed like that. It's a sentient being, living animals with all the, the you know, it, it can, I mean, it can feel pain, it can see, it can hear, everything. And it dies like that, millions. Yeah, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about? So we need we need we need we need to be transparent in that respect, and then then we have to to think or rethink our way of think our way of rearing, rearing the animals but because they are alternatives, and maybe we can discuss about alternatives. Going back to the results, uh, seven percent of uh, of the people they they want they really ask for more controls, more controls in farm. So it's up to public authorities, up to. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I work for the, veteran, the national veteran system in Italy and I see they want, I mean, public want us to go and control. Control and now the approach you find, you don't find, you, we need to find an approach, but we have to go in the farm and check what is going on and try to ensure and to enforce the legislation. Uh, mm, a lot of the people, 90% of the people, they, they believe that we have extra, extra legislation on some other species like dairy cows, uh, cats, dogs. Uh, again, tail dogging of pigs, you know, in the pig industry, I mean, we have to cut the tail for cannibalism reasons. <laughs> this is something, this is something that people doesn't want to see anymore. Uh, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm engaged in a personal battle against uh, the mutilation in dogs, you know, ear cropping and tail dogging in dogs like pit bull terrier, like uh, mastiff, like uh, arm stuff. This is, this is prohibited, but it's still many. And I saw here in Serbia too, many animals that are here cropped and tail dogged. And this is a, is a, a big problem. This is a major offense in Italy, at least, I mean, if you've got a dog with ear, uh, ear cropped or tail dog uh, without any justification from a vet, 
and most of the justification from, from other colleagues are fake justification in order to, you see, like Doberman, uh, Pincher, Dog, with these nice things. This is no, more, no longer acceptable. I mean, I'm a behaviorist. This is my, I, I do, I'm a behaviorist. And it's, it's like, uh, how can a dog can express himself without using the ear or the, or the tail? It's like, as if you, can you, can you talk without, uh, letter A, letter R, and letter T, your language. I mean, your, your talking will be impaired because you don't know how to, to talk. You don't have the instruments to talk. And this is, I mean, dogs, they used ear and, 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 and the tail to express themselves. So it's, it's very, it's a, it's, I'm, I'm very much in favor. I'm not, I become like this. I wasn't like this when I was younger, as I told you. And I'm studying and being an, and becoming a, a behaviorist as a specialization. I, I I I found it totally unacceptable. There's no grounds, no grounds, to 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 do ear cropping, and tail docking in in dogs, and also in pigs. I mean, there are alternatives. I mean, and and Tony will say something about that as well. Another huge hot topic that you will be listening about is the phasing out of the use of cages. Uh, like it or not, I mean, very soon we will be dealing with the fact that we're not gonna use the cages anymore. Uh, you, you know about what is farrowing, farrowing crates for, for sow, pig industry, for piglet industry. They are already banned. We have we had in Italy derogation of a uh, few years, and in uh, like in five, I think it's in three years, all the the piglet industry in in Italy will be done without the use of farrowing crates, and this is going to be the same in laying hens, and in calves already is, is is done. Thank God, this calves crates is something that was was used when I, when I was very very young, and that was. Uh, to produce uh, pink, pink meat uh, um, calf. And there was really under horrible welfare condition. I mean, without silage, under <coughs> in, uh, uh, with low, very low, low level of iron in the blood and to have the, the meat that clear. I mean, only based on, and the feed on, only on milk or something derived from milk. So the calf, I mean, uh, uh, pink, we call white meat, but pink meat bill uh, production is no longer uh, possible to be produced in Italy. Forced feed, the geese, pate, uh, pate gras, how do you say, the pate, pate de uh, foie gras, yeah, pate foie gras in, 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 is another, another, another big issue and has to be, animals in cage, uh, forced fed, and this, all these things. I mean, sooner or later, we have to forget about it. I mean, I understand there are concerns from the industry. I, I understand there are concerns about traditions and uh, other, other, other stakeholders, but we have to sit down around the table, discuss, and find a solution for these hot topics. Again, another, problem is the maximum journey times as i said to you before i mean moving animals all around europe from hours and hours and hours because here because of the long distance transport is still transport of animals is still acceptable by law but uh, there are some condition where and has been uh, uh, proven uh, filmed on the border for example in in summertime in the border between greece and, and Turkey, a lines of truck waiting in, in August at 45 degrees with cows or pigs in there. I mean, they were dying like, like, like flies. And this is not acceptable anymore. This is, uh, this is something that has to be, you know, has to be changed. That's why there's a, the, the legislation on animal welfare, uh, on transport of animal is under revision. That's why vast majority of the people, they do believe that export to non-EU countries for slaughter should be prohibited. 
imagine, I mean, Serbia is a net importer of live animals because for some reason, and that's another issue that probably Nendat will say something, I don't know why, you don't produce enough meat because livestock industry is so poor at the moment in, in Serbia, but you have the potentiality to do really good and you import animals. Imagine if you will be prohibited one day to import live animals to be killed here in, in Serbia. And there's a public demand on that. I mean, the people doesn't want to see animals crossing border into nations or countries that have not the same level or standard of animal welfare. Even if I would say that Serbia has very high standards, but still there's a demand. I'm, I'm reporting what is written in these reports. Uh, again, 94% of respondents, they say that, of course, some vulnerable category of animals shouldn't be transported at all. Pregnant cows, unwind calves. Again, as I said to you, we already said everything, killing on one day old male chicks is no longer acceptable. And something should be done. Uh, there are alternatives, they cost a bit, but it's something that we are ready, we have to pay. I mean, we can, there are techniques we can detect male uh, embryos in eggs, uh, ninth day, I guess, uh, eighth, ninth day. Yeah, well, yeah, no, for, for, a little bit later. Yeah, around the 10th day, yeah. you, can, you, can, you can spot and you can, at least you kill the embryos inside the, and the eggs. You don't, you don't have to kill the, 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 the chicks. Of course, uh, this is, is a time-consuming procedure and time-consuming means money. Uh, money profits and then <laughs> you know we have to deal with with this uh, again um, I don't know how many of you have been thinking about killing of fish I mean we don't we normally we don't kill fish simply because we take the fish out of the water leave it in the air and they die for suffocation as if we will be killing calf or pig in 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 the abattoir suffocating them is the same is exactly the same so it's uh as you you could say what is the wild catch when you wild catch fishing you know in the sea you, you cannot do anything else but let them die suffocating in in the hair yeah you agree i agree and uh, i see the point but when you have uh farm fishing Farm fishing, you have big fish like salmon, like trout, and you technically have the capacity to kill the animals on the spot, like stunning the animals. And so this, there's a demand for that. Uh, the problem is, of course, you don't, you don't, you don't feel empathic. And, and, and Tony will be talking about em empathy as uh, the main thing that is on the animal welfare. The empathy... You don't, you don't feel much of empathy on, on a trout with a trout or a salmon because it doesn't make any sound. It just die a bit of tick, 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 but then that's it. I mean, you in, in, in your sack and that's it. But it's suffering. <laughs> I mean, he has nociceptor. He has all the nervous system geared up to feel pain. Then this is a problem. From the survey, we had, uh, we go for the labeling. Uh, labeling is an option. If we can label a product like animal welfare friendly labeling system, uh, there's a huge demand, 9% of respondents, they say that they want a, a nice and clear labeling system. And we will, I will give another presentation later on about the labeling because there are a lot many concerns about labeling, but labeling could be a way to ensure a product is done uh, in animal welfare friendly manner. So label, labeling uh, should be not only uh, stating or giving an idea of how the animal was, was reared, but also how the animal was transported and how the animal was slaughtered. Uh, and we will see these uh, farther up during the day. 
Um, so we will say to finish off the Eurobarometer, the welfare of farm animals is a huge concern for European population. Uh, is not uh, farming in, in Europe is perceived not only as a means of food production. Uh, Temple Grandin, she's uh, one of the finest scientists. It's an American scientist, actually. She's aut autistic. Autistic. Yeah. She's kind of autistic. She's not even that. Uh, she's a, 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 not a severe form of autism, but she is kind of, and that's why she understands very much the way the animal's thinking. And she has been working in Europe as well. And she said that European consumers are, are, are willing, she, she did a job, are willing to pay a little bit more price on the product to have animal welfare friendly products. Uh, in general, Reading University, they, they found out that uh, the meat deriving from animals reared with higher welfare standards are generally safer, healthier, and environmentally friendly. I mean, we know what is the Green Deal. I know that our attention has been diverted now because of the Ukraine and Russia and things, and we have an, an energy huge problem, especially in Italy, because we we survive on, on the Russian gas. So, so we don't know. I think we are thinking again to start up the the, the new power plant on on, uh, on 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 carbon which is uh, on coal i mean we're going to start it back in coal because i mean we are cutting off the gas coming from uh russia and but you know that we have the green deal and we need to do something for the env environment because we live in this world and i don't want to be a repeating to make you sad but uh is an urgent need is a very urgent need so it's always also animal welfare friendly it means also some sometimes, and this is this is debatable. But we have to consider also the, the issue about the environment. Now this and again, uh, this is about the import. And again, import, uh, as I said to you before, animal welfare could be used as a tool to stop moving goods from EU and not EU, giving that accession of Serbia is a very slow procedure and for some reasons, and we're not gonna go into that, but uh, it can be used as a barrier for trading between EU and non-EU countries, animal welfare. Uh, animal welfare should be a, so a constituent aspect of the, of the image of the product itself, and animal welfare should be integrated in the food and feed control system, in, in direct payment and the rural development strategy in the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, and will be integrated, will be integrating in the organic production, production standard. And above all, and this is, uh, relates to Serbia, any bilateral trade agreement of cooperation, animal welfare will be integrated in every agreement. So here you can see that animal welfare is not only a, a matter of stakeholders, but is a stakeholders is also a politician, is also policy attention. From one side, you have a, a civil society movement demanding for more stringent animal welfare regulation. And, and the, go, the governmental people should listen and should start doing something. And in that respect, we are far away from the from the uh, from the ideal goal. Uh, as you know, I, I don't have to tell you. You know exactly what is Serbia. Is uh, agriculture is very very important. I mean, livestock production lately is going down, and Andreas, our junior expert, will tell us much more about the figures and values and things. And uh, I would say that food processing industry is not up to date and should likes of modern technology. Uh, I said, no, I normally said an example about Italian branding. I mean, we are not smart. I, I don't know why, but wherever we go as Italian, 
everybody knows about our stuff. I mean, if I say Parmigiano Reggiano, everybody knows what is a Parmigiano Reggiano. If I say Prosciutto di Parma, everybody knows what is Prosciutto di Parma. If I say Nutella, everybody understands what Nutella is. For some reason, Italian uh, family, family business, and then they grow up as a huge company. They preserve, they are very proud of what they're doing, and they, they made it they made out, out of the food producing industry fortune. I think probably in Italy now is the only industry that works fine. We don't have any, any other good things like that. We don't have no problem on that. I mean, I always set an example and I will be saying again, I mean, have, have you heard about balsamic vinegar? Balsamic vinegar, more than a balsamic vinegar. Okay. I remember I was working in around Modena area with uh, beef cattle. And I was staying there and I had, I, I, 25 years ago, I tried the first time the real balsamic vinegar and balsamic was, it was a novelty for me then. And I said, well, what is this strange? The, the real one, the real one is not what you find in the supermarket. It's extra expensive. I mean, a bottle like this could cost 300 euros, 400 euros. And it's much sweeter, much thicker, and you put on 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 strawberries and on parmesan. It's it's crazy. It's totally different to what you can find. But nevertheless, these people around Modena they made a consortium and they start to produce and to spread this product all over Italy. And they start to spread it in Europe. Now you, I can, I can go any restaurant in Belgrade and find balsamic vinegar. I know even find it in Italy. And I found out just in, on the television last week, 99% of the Italian production of balsamic uh, vinegar goes abroad. I don't know, maybe, maybe the marketing capacities is, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really angry when I love Kaimak. How can I find Kaimak in Italy? Why I cannot find Kaimak in Italy? And this is a problem. I mean, you should, you, you as Serbian, you should be proud of what you produce. You should be uh, safeguard your, your stuff and believe in what you're producing and try to put this stuff, if you really believe that it are good, in, in the global market. We have all the means. I mean, you have to protect your stuff. I mean, uh, I don't want to go to the restaurant in Novi Sad or in Kraljevo uh, or Beograd and eating uh, pasta alla carbonara. What is that? I want, I don't know, Serbian stuff. I want to see, eat that stuff. I mean, uh, and this is, this is the only way to, if you're not proud of your product, who else would be? You have to start with being very proud of what you're doing and then propose your product to all the world. And then eventually with a hard work, you will made it. I mean, I mean, these people for, I mean, balsamic vinegar, I was shocked, Nutella. Oh. Nutella is the only thing you can pay. It's, I mean, so, so, I mean, it's like Coca-Cola. I don't know how and I don't know why, but they made it. So we got, you have to, to protect your stuff. And you, to protect your stuff, you have to produce the best possible way. You have to find a systematic uh, marketing, uh, uh, I would say, uh, ma marketing uh, chain, trying to get into other different markets. Because you have good stuff. And I was in the countryside. I had very nice food from, from Serbian stuff. So, I mean, why not? Why not Serbia? Again, Serbia is an importer of animals. This is incredible. This is incredible. It's, I mean, it's planned. I mean, in Italy, we have, oh, we have nothing. What do we have in Italy? I mean, we have just the, the plan around the Po Valley, where Parmigiano, pig, prosciutto di Parma, is everything is there. And it's much smaller than the plan you have here in, 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 in Serbia. I, I don't, I really I don't understand. I mean, why the system goes there, that really, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, it really uh, annoys me a lot, annoys me a lot because I, I don't understand because you could do, you really could do a very good job in agriculture. You could be top of the, top of the world doing the things, but you're still, you have a road to go anyway. The husbandry system, so as I was saying, is undergoing a huge renewal. And then he was saying something yesterday I was very interested in. It was translated by Andreas. And it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of political things to, do, to be done. EU approved slaughterhouse are not enough. 
So we should increase, I mean, you, we should, uh, in Serbia should be increased the animal welfare standard at farm level. We should reduce the movements of live animals. You have to produce uh, short movement and kill and transform there on the spot. So for, for many reasons, animal welfare reasons, uh, climate change reason, emission of CO2, because I mean, uh, moving animals, it's, uh, uh, it's energetically very costly. Increase the animal welfare uh, standards in abattoir and then labeling. That is, that is the way to protect and to state what you're doing and what you're doing is, is the right thing to go. So what, what, to my opinion and to the opinion of the scientists we, I represent, I mean, uh, the roadmap for Serbia is to have new farms. It's time to change the generation because as Andrea will say in a minute, um, the mean, I mean, the, 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 the farmers in Serbia are very old. There's no new generation of, of, of young farmers. And you need to renew this, uh, the, the, the age of the farmers. We need new slaughterhouses with higher standards and new processing plant. Thank you for the attention. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, um, we are here, and now I lend, I leave my, uh, the floor to Tony. Tony, can you, yes. we, we try if it works. Let's see if it's working with one. Uh, he will tell us something about the principle of animal welfare. Yes. No. Hello. Hello. Okay. So the idea of this second talk is to talk about what animal welfare is. Okay. Which is the origin of animal welfare and how we can define it and which is the main problems we have when we are trying to be focused on, on animal welfare questions. So the first point is what animal welfare is and to uh, discuss about this, I will say you, that is one of the questions that I have done more times in my life, okay, in places as this one, in big conferences, small conferences, in schools, in, sec in universities, I have always asked it. In fact, five years ago, I was coordinating a project, European project, in which we were just asking a lot of things. And one of the points that we were asking is what is animal welfare? And we were asking to secondary school students, we were asking to university students from, uh, I think they were future teachers, future uh, reporters, TV reporters and so on, doctors, and I don't know which, which careers, but we asked people that was not related with uh, animal science. And we asked as well to professionals, veterinarians, farmers, and et cetera. The professionals, when you ask for animal welfare, they said, okay, is that the animal more or less have a good housing, good health, and uh, a good feeding state. So it's feeding, health, and housing. When you are asking to the general society, these students, we did it as well in the supermarket with general citizens. When you are going to the general citizens, the main answer is, animal welfare is to take care of the animals animal welfare is that humans are treating well the animals and this is the main definition of animal welfare that we have outside in the street in our society animal welfare is to treat well the animals animal welfare is how humans are treating animals this is a big issue this is a big problem because if you see the question was, what is animal welfare? Something that belongs to the animal. And the answer is how I, human, am treating the animal. What I, human, am doing with the animals. This means anthropocentrist. This means that our view, the view of the general society of what is animal welfare, is a view that depends not on the animals, but on the actions that humans 
are doing with the animals. And this is something that we will need to change in the next years. And this will, cha this will change in the next years. As it changed for women in the past. The past when you ask it to a husband, how is you a woman? It's fine because I'm treating her very well. This was easy to hear. Nowadays, nobody will answer something like that. But we understand that the welfare, the well-being of the woman is something that belongs to the woman. How is you a woman? Well, it's fine, it's happy and happy. It's not depends of how I'm treating my, my woman. It's not depends of how I'm treating my sons. It's something that belongs to the, to the, to the individual. With the animals will happen something similar. We will need to move to this another view in which animal welfare belongs to the animal. It's true that part of the animal welfare depends on the people that is taking care of these animals. It's true. They have a role in the welfare of the animals, but they don't define the welfare of the animals. They just have an impact on this welfare. But the welfare is something that belongs to the animal, not to the humans. We cannot check humans for checking animal welfare. And this is something that you will see in several places. For instance, a lot of certification scams on animal welfare, they are checking just inputs. What we are doing with the animals, where the animals are living. This is nice, but this is just a good practice guideline. This is not telling you anything about animal welfare. Because you are not checking animal welfare. You cannot certify something that you are not assessing. You are just assessing risk factors. That is, how is the environment, what I am doing with the animal? But the welfare of the animal is the experience of life of this animal in the surroundings. Because this is something that we need to change. Related with this anthropocentrism, there is a lot of uh, things that we need to change. The first one is that even in the European Union, you can see some questions sometimes in Brussels that they say, okay, how you are ensuring animal welfare? I was asked six months ago about this. One survey from the European Union. How you are ensuring animal welfare? My question is, how I can ensure animal welfare? My question is, you can ensure the welfare of your children, your sons and daughters. You are, you are able to ensure their well-being, their welfare. My answer is no. You will fight all your life to improve their welfare and to try to give the best possibilities to go ahead. But you cannot ensure the welfare of your children. Because you accept that welfare depends on a lot of different things that is not just I am doing with the, with the animals, with my sons, with my children. So why in humans we understand that it's so difficult and in animals not? Something like regulations. How many regulations we have in the world? How many laws we have in different countries in the laws? Millions. All law, every... Eh? No, in all the world, millions, because they are repeated country to country to country. So which one, okay, all these, all these rules are written just trying to, to help improve the welfare of the humanity. Every time that somebody is writing a rule, okay, it's writing a law, it's because something needs to be done to improve the welfare of the society. The question is, give me one, one in the world, one, that could ensure the welfare of the humanity. One, no one. Why? Because we accept that welfare, well-being is too difficult to be ensured with a regulation because it depends on a lot of things. It's something that is individual. It depends on each individual, how we live, how we understand our surroundings, how we are, uh, developing in our surroundings and nobody can ensure us our well-being. So why we think 
Why, European Union, you think that I can ensure animal welfare? I cannot. Why? Because it depends on the animal. This is the anthropocentric view. We cannot ensure the welfare of our humans, but we can ensure the welfare of animals. Why? Because we are God with the animals. No, because we are considering the animal something that is below that ourselves. And this is a big issue. So this is something that will change in the future. And you will see that we change in a normal way. Okay, and you will see that in some years, when somebody will say, what is animal welfare? And the answer is taking care of the animals. Everybody will, will see him and say, what, what, you are, what are you telling? This is not right. And we will change this. Well, when we are asking to a human, how are you? How are you? And you say, I'm fine. What you are thinking about? You are thinking about your mental state, how your brain is working. Some people say, no, 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 no. When I'm telling I am fine, I'm referring to my health. Yes, it's true. But it's also true that not always when you are saying I'm fine, it depends just of your health. Imagine that you are in the morning and say, how are you? And you're fine. Perfect. Good. And see, I'm, I am seeing you again in the afternoon. And in the afternoon, I am asking you again, how are you? Oh, I'm bad, I'm very bad. What happened? In the morning, you were fine. What happened in the afternoon? Well, I went to the doctor, and the doctor said to me that I am ill. And now, I'm not fine. The question that is that in the morning, at 8 in the morning, you were already ill, but you didn't know. When you don't know that you are ill and somebody is asking you, how are you? You are fine. So where is the welfare of a human? In the brain. Human welfare is how the brain is, how the mental state of the animal, of the human is. So for animals, we need to think in the same way. Where is animal welfare? In the brain of the animal. How the brain works in this animal. How the animal is in the environment where it is problem, we cannot assess. We cannot assess these emotions in animals. We cannot assess these emotions in humans. So why I put this picture here? Because at the end, human welfare or human well-being, well-being and animal welfare should be something very similar. There is no big differences between these, these two species. We will talk about one big difference between these two species later. But in general, in both cases, anim in both cases, the welfare depends on how the brain is working. And before to talk about this species of here, I will talk a little bit about the humans. Let's talk about a little bit about the humans. <clears throat> we are visual species. We like to see nice places. For us, this is a very nice landscape. Now, now it's a very nice landscape because now we know what are these lights. You need to imagine in the past, our ancestors, the first time that somebody saw something like this, it was something like, wow, this is terrible. This is the end of the world. What's happening in the sky? Okay, but now that we know what is this, with the knowledge of what is this, we are enjoying a lot this kind of lights in the sky. And there is thousands of people every year going to the north of Europe, okay, just to see these spectacular likes, because we love this. We are visual species, but we are as well very contradictory species. See this landscape. You, you like this landscape? It's nice. There is people that is going to see this kind of things, or this one with lavanda. It's nice as well, the people like this. And the people is going to see this and saying, okay, I'm young in the natural landscape. I am in the nature, I'm going to see. What is natural here? Nothing. There is nothing of natural here. This is homemade, I, this is human made. This is natural. And we know this. 
And in fact, when you are asking somebody, okay, what do you think is better? This one or this one in terms of biodiversity, in terms for the insects, in terms for fungus, in terms of for bacteria, the people will answer always the right answer, this one. But, but when we have this one in our garden, we think that, that, our, that, our, that our garden is dirty and we need to cut this and to have a very nice and green garden without biodiversity, without different plants, just uniformity, because it's nicer to the view. Why? Because we are contradictory. We know that it's better this than this, but we like that, that more than this. Humans are contradictory species. And this is important to take into account because this will be applied as well to animal welfare. These contradictories of our species. For instance, when we are going to the, you know, the, the natural uh, movement of the humanity has been to go from the rural areas to the urban areas. We are changing the way we are living. We are going away from our natural resources and we are going to something that like this, an environment that is modified. An environment in which we don't have predators, we don't have insects, we don't have infections, we don't have, well, we have COVID, <laughs> okay? <laughs> But we don't have, we, we, we are controlling the temperature, we are controlling a lot of things. We move from the nature and we move, we were to a different environment where we could survive in a better way. It's better for our sons, for our children, it's better for us. We change it the way we like. But we have a problem, we are contradictory species. We know that we are living better in this environment, far away from the natural conditions. But we were during two millions, we are a species of two millions of age. During two millions of age, 99% of the time, we were in the natural conditions. We had a very bad life. We were dying very young with a lot of diseases and with starvation and with hunger and with a lot of things, things that all the humanity, it comes from a population of 200 to 400 people that was escaping from Africa some years ago. If these people should not escape from there, now the humanity would not exist. So everybody, all of you, de depends of a population of 400 people several years ago. So we were very close to extinction. Why? Because we were in the nature in the natural conditions. 10,000 years ago, we did something spectacular. We domesticated plants and animals and our life changed. It's when the history of the humanity begins. All that is from here behind is the prehistory. The history begins when we begin to domesticate plants and animals, and we fix the land, and we begin to build cities, and we begin to write what we are doing in our life, and this is the initial part of our story. And when the, we will see some graph later, when our history or our demography is in beginning to increase, when we could domesticate the natural resources and we, we could change and adapt our environment to our needs, not to what we had in natural conditions. And we know this, but we had a 90% of our life in the nature and we miss the nature. We miss this environment. So in the weekend, when we are going to the mountain, when we are going to the landscape, what happens is that our pressure, blood pressure is reduced. We are producing endorphins, but we are contradictory. Why? Because we are living in an environment in which we don't have these kind of things. 
<clears throat> there is places in the world in which going to the natural, going to the natural conditions means that you can die. When I'm going with my son to make uh, a walk in the natural, I'm living in a very small village and I have a lot of lakes just behind at home. And I remember my son of four years, just two weeks ago, he said to me, oh, Wow, that take care there is crocodiles. Say, no, there is no crocodiles. Don't worry, Rock. Okay, because he saw a picture, I a picture, a film with crocodiles. But we don't have crocodiles, we don't have wolf, we don't have anything around that can damage my son. And I can go with my son in this way and I'm walking to the nature. The, the question is, this is not nature. It's not true. It's, it's, we, we take during years, we take all the predators, all the risk, all the problems out of this landscape and we are going just there as a visitors. We are not living in natural conditions. We are changing our environment to be peacefully working with our sons without the risk to be killed by a lion, by, I don't know. So, and we know this, but we feel that this is natural conditions. So the problem is that as we are producing endorphins when we are in these natural conditions. We feel happy when we are in these natural conditions. When we see other animals that are in the natural conditions, we think, okay, this animal is as well happy because he's in natural conditions. But the problem is that at eight o'clock in the night, we will return at home, we will go to the hotel and we will have our dinner, but the animals that were there will be there forever. This is the point that we need to understand. Our contradictory view of what natural conditions is. It's not the same to live in natural conditions than to visit once every seven days the natural landscape. It's not the same. And we need to understand that. Another example of contradiction in humanity. If I ask you, which is your idea of the uh, industrial revolution? You will have in your mind something like this. Oh, industrial revolution. Wow, no, contamination, smoke, bad things. And I would say to you, okay, are you sure about that the industrial revolution was so bad for the humanity? There is one TED talk in YouTube, you can write some sometimes as is, uh, washing machine, TED talk, washing machine. It's a man that is explaining how the first washing machine arrived at his home. And he is explaining that we, they were waiting, his mother and his grandmother, they were waiting for the washing machine during weeks and weeks and weeks. And when the washing, washing machine arrived, it was like a party. And he explains, and then they begin, I remember, they, they begin to put clothes inside the washing machines. And after the talk, they open the washing machines and they begin to take out books. Clothes inside, books outside. Because he explains, my mother was every day, all the morning, in the river, just washing clothes. Every, every, every day of his life. When the washing machine arrived, this work was done by the washing machine and my mother had all the morning free. And my mother decided to go to the university to study because she has free time to do it. And this changed the history of all my family, explains this guy in this TED talk. Why? Because this industrial revolution changed everything. There is some, I was, I was reading some, some weeks ago, a book, it was, was explaining that it's it easy to see people from the 90s that is telling something, okay, I have, I had in my life six or seven sons, and I'm not sure. And now it's something, how? Why? Because of these six or seven sons, five died before the two or three years old. It was usual. 100 years ago, 150 years ago, that the sons, that the daughters, the daughters were dying before arriving to the teenager. Now, 
It's something that we cannot believe that you will have a son and he will not survive. And we have reduced the number of, of, of children just because of, the, of this as well, because the survival is very high. We are arriving now to 80, 90 years old. This is because of the Industrial Revolution. When we are now thinking in, in going to, uh, to travel or to do holidays or something, like that, this is Industrial Revolution. And this is the Industrial Revolution. This is the, po the, the worldwide population. And you see how this big increase here, this is because of the Industrial Revolution. The humanity increases because of the industrial revolution, but we are contradictory species. We think in smoke and contamination. That's, they were there, of course, but we are, our success today depends on the, of the industrial revolution. Problem, our, access, our success today, okay, is, can be our big issue, uh, our big problem today. We have a lot of people in the world. And we are a lot of people in the world, and we have a lot of animals that are going with us. This list of animals of here is the list of the higher animals for species in the world if you take out insects. If you take out insects and you count for each species, wild beasts, uh, impalas, I don't know, any species in the world, and you count how many, num how many animals you have, this is the list of the big ones. And in this list of the big ones, all the ones that are bold in the, in the file are related with the human activity. Chickens, cats, cattle, sheep, swine, goats, dogs are strictly directed to the human activity. And they care, rats and mice, okay, are as well related with the human activity. Rats increases where humans live. Rats live where humans live. It's a species that is coming with us. Also, we are not reading rats, except a small proportion of the rats that are laboratory rats. But you see the impact that we have in the world is because we are a lot, and we have a lot of animals with us. The only one of, in this list that is not related with humans is the common kelea that is a bird that is living in Africa. It's the only one. All the rest depends on the human activity. So what does it mean? It means that we have an impact on the world. It's clear. If tomorrow all the humanity decide to eat only tom tomatoes, in 15 days or in two months, the tomato will be the best or the worst climatic problem in the world because we are a lot. We are a lot of people. So what it means, it means that the young population, especially the young population, is very worried about this. They know that we have a high impact in the planet. So they are trying to look for the way, okay, to manage this, <clears throat> to see a future in this context and to see what they can do. And animal welfare will be one of the points that they want to do something with this. This is the society we have. We have a society that is based in a lot of values. But I will talk of about two very important values that are very important for animal welfare. That are freedom of choice and empathy, freedom of choice and empathy. I remember my grandfather that explained me once that when he was young, he had his he, he said to his parents, to his, to his father, that he wanted to be a painter. And his father made Pah! what you are saying. You are living under my house. You have a uh, place to, to rest, to, 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 to sleep. You have a dish and you are in, in the desk. I will say you what you will study because I know what you need to go ahead and you don't have any idea about what you need to do. This was the answer of the father of my grandfather. 
And my grandfather was never a painter. This has changed. This has changed. And now the new people, okay, the young people, in fact, 10 years ago, when you were asking, at least in my country, when you were asking to a uh, father, what you what your uh, son will study? The answer was, well, what they want. This was a big change. Now, when you are asking today, when you are asking what you will study will, will do, the, the sentence has changed a little bit. The answer is, well, what make him happy? We are doing this uh, travel. Our society is going from, I am the authority, you will do what I'm doing. So, no, please try to be happy. We are moving to an emotional society. And this emotional society is fighting to be happy. And our sons, the message is you need to be happy. And the second message is to be happy you, you need to understand how to make happy all the other ones. You need to have empathy for the others. And when you are in the school now, I am a father and you are going to the school, the teachers are asking you to show empathy, to be empathetic with your son, with your children. You need to understand them. You need to put in their side. We have an empathetic society and we have a freedom of choice society. The empathy is a word that we never used it before. My, my grandfather never used the word empathy. The empathy is a word that appeared in the USA at the beginning of the 20th century. And during a lot of years was used only for psychiatrics and psychologues in psychology. It was at the end in the 80s and 90s of the 20th century that this word became to go to the society and we begin to talk with empathy. Now in 2022, Everybody understand that we need to be empathetic with other people. So what you have in front is a society that is fighting for a freedom of cho choice and empathy. So when they try to make a relationship with other species, species that are not humans, they will use the same values. They will try to look for the freedom of choice and the empathy. Problem, we are a contradictory species. So we don't know what is freedom of choice. And sometimes we think that a landscape, a natural conditions is freedom of choice. And it isn't, it's not true. This is a good example. Okay, this is a group of flamings that are living. And you see that this is the last part of the group. Oh, this is the last one. Oh. I'm losing. And now you will see one of these animals that can now follow the group. Why? Because he has some salt in the legs and this makes him to walk with very difficulties. This is natural conditions, this happens. And we have seen this in the TV several times. How animals are suffering, how animals are dying. We know that natural conditions are not ensuring the welfare of anybody. But why we are thinking then that freedom of choice is just a landscape? Is it true? There is not freedom of choice for this animal. There is not freedom of choice when you are in an environment in which you cannot eat a cow in a landscape without a good grass, it has not freedom of choice. A rabbit that has a big pressure of wolf don't have freedom of choice. If you have an area without water, you don't have freedom of choice. It's not true that a landscape is freedom of choice. It has some feelings of freedom for us as humans that we are living here closed in our modified environment. And when we are going to the weekend, to the nature, we feel that we are freedom there. But we cannot put the animals that are living there as, the, as 
if they are in a freedom of choice situation. It's not true in most of the cases. They are limited by the nature. In fact, in most of the cases, it's more limited a natural environment than a modified environment in which you can provide water, food, veterinary services, etc., etc. It's more limiting the natural environment. So it's not true that this is freedom of choice. Choice. The other one, the other one problem is the empathy. We can, we know that we need to show empathy from other animals or from other humans, but we don't know how to do it. We are not so good as we think showing this empathy. Because most of the times what we are doing is a projection. Humans are very nice or very good projecting ourselves in another situation. How I would feel in this situation. This is not empathy. The empathy is trying to understand how he is feeling in his situation. I put sometimes an example that is about, uh, I don't know, imagine that you have here a guy and you say a common sentence and the guy is very annoying because of the sentence, because he has a very bad experience in the past. Imagine somebody that is feeling booing during years and years and years. And you are here and you're doing a joke. Ah, bah, 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 and he feels that you are going against him. And then you say, okay, okay, I will try to be empathetic. I will try to put in his situation. And then you say, ah, it's not so terrible. Take care. You are not being empathetic, probably, because you are putting in your life without booing. And you are understanding the, con the comment as in your situation without bullying in your life. But if you try to understand with somebody that has suffered bullying during years, probably you will understand better that the sentence was not so good. And this is very difficult to do a real exercise of empathy. And with animals, it's something similar. We used not to do an empathetic exercise. We are doing a projection on our animals. And this is a very critical issue. For instance, now in Spain, we have some people that is going to the slaughterhouses. houses. It's stopping the, the trucks before going inside the slaughterhouses, houses. And it's telling bye to the pigs and it's touching the pigs. And they tell, oh, I'm feeling how he's suffering because he knows he will die. Because he knows that he will die inside. This is very dangerous because this is just a projection. Because you, if you are in the track, you will know that you will die and you will be sad, but the pig don't know that will die. And this is a very important issue because we are the lonely, the unique species that we know that we will die. You can have, I, 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 I saw some videos and Antonio knows a lot about this when they have diseases in the United Kingdom and they had to kill a lot of cattle. See some videos in which you can see how you, there is people from a long distance killing a cow and you can see how the cow is going down, clack, and the other cow is behind, not doing anything. Why? Because this cow don't know, don't, don't have the capacity to say, okay, if the animal is going down because I need that, uh, probably the next one will be me, will be me, so let's escape. They don't have this capacity or this ability. This is something that is human. The capacity to predict the future, to see, okay, if this man is being killed, probably, and the, the, the man is going with a gun in the hand, probably the next one will be myself. Okay, this is a human capacity. I stayed a lot of hours in the slaughterhouses. You can see pigs, seeing other pigs dying. The pigs are not afraid of that. But if the pig is crying before, is in, ah, then the other pig is afraid because this is the communication between pigs. So when we are trying to be empathetic with other animals, we need to understand the other animals. You cannot stay in the place of the other if you don't understand how this other is, how this other behave. And this is one of the big issues 
of a lot of people that thinks that is doing an empathy exercise and what he's doing is an anthropocentric exercise projecting themselves on the animals. And this is a big issue and it's an ethical problem. Because when you say them, no, the cow don't know that he will die. The pig don't know that he will die. They think that you are considering the cow as something less than humans. And this is a second problem. Because the question is, why do you think that to be conscious that you will die, why do you think that to be a sapient is better than not to be it? Which proof you have that humans, that the homo sapiens will be able to survive in this world better than a pig or than a cow? Why do you think that to prove that you love this animal, you need to prove, to approach this animal to the human qualities? Why? A pig is good because it's a pig. It's not to love an animal if you need to approach this animal to your qualities to give him more value. This is, this is exactly the contrary. You are, you are taking out the value of the animal. The pig is, you need to, to love pigs, to love cattle because they are pigs and cattle, not because they are similar to what or how you are feeling. No, you are another species. You think that life, or you see the life in another way, this is something that we need to change. The empathy, the empathy begins, okay, begins understanding how the other behaves, how the other feels. I have discussed a lot of things, a lot of times with people without any kind of training about this. I decided with seven years old that I loved animals. And I try it to understand how they behave. And for this reason, I studied veterinary science. And after this, I did a PhD as a doctorate. And after this, I have been working during 20 years in animal welfare. And every day I'm understanding something new on the animals. This is empathy trying to understand how the animal behaves. Because a pig in a slaughterhouse has a lot of problems, several problems. But one of the problems is not that the animals know that we lie. You can stay in a slaughterhouse and you have a courting that is doing something like this. This is a big problem for a pig. And we'll be afraid of this. We need to arrange this not to explain the pig that he will die. Don't have any sense. So we need to change as well that freedom is not a landscape. Freedom of choice is that the animal can have a real freedom of choice. I want to eat here, I can't eat. I want to drink that, I can. Okay, this is a real freedom of choice. So we need to look all this in a different way. And to look this in a different way, the only thing that we need to do, to do is to be aware of the difference between what is animal welfare and what is animal protection. Both are interesting things, but animal protection is what we will do as, as humans to try to protect and improve animal welfare. And animal welfare is just something that belongs to the animal. So if we want to look at it differently, we need to be more focused on the animal and their needs, how they behave, which is their evolution. Okay, when I'm doing a talk on animal welfare, it's funny because the people say to me, okay, you are always beginning with evolution of the species. Of course, the first 10 minutes, I'm always explaining where the pig is coming, from where the cow is coming, from where the lion hen is coming. Because you will never understand any species if you don't understand why the species arrived to the place where you have now. The evolution of the species, the environment where the species was born, the environment where the species was developing. Why a pig have a small eyes and very, very, <laughs> not very nice eyes. Why cattle have big eyes? Why horses have a small ears? 
Why horses move as they move? How pigs don't make the movements that horses do? These have an explanation that is according to evolution of the species. And we need to know this. And to need to understand this. The modern animal welfare movement begins in the 60s in the United Kingdom. There was one woman, Ruth Harrison, that wrote a book named Animal Machines. And this book, they were saying, okay, we are doing something wrong. We are changing the farms for factories. And we are sending something that are sentient beings, animals with capacity of having emotions for something that it seems that like they are like glaciers. <clears throat> so we need to change this. And in United Kingdom, this book has a high impact. So high that the United Kingdom, that the Britain government decided to make a committee to abort the question of animal welfare. The, the first one was the Bramble Committee. And from the Bramble Committee appears a second one that was the Farm Animal Welfare Council. And this Farm Animal Welfare Council had the same problems that we had. How to define animal welfare? They said, okay, we have three definitions of animal welfare. The first one is the original one. Base it in emotional states. If humans of human, human well being depends of, of emotional states, animal welfare should depend as well of, animal, of, animal, of emotional states. Problem we cannot assess emotional states in animals. I cannot go to a farm and close the farm because I see that the cows are unhappy. I cannot assess this. So we said, okay, this is the original definition of animal welfare, but we cannot work with this. So let's try to look for a, an alternative. The second alternative was the one that we talked during most of the morning, that is natural conditions. Why? Because when you are asking somebody in the street, what is for you animal welfare? Who will say, what is, for instance, the welfare of a cow for you? The answer will be, okay, it's a happy cow. Emotional stage. It's a happy cow, it's a happy cow. Ah, it's a happy cow that is in a very nice grassland. The cow is happy because it's in the natural conditions. So this is the second definition, but we saw this is not a good definition of animal welfare. It's not true. So we cannot work with this because it's not true. It's true that it has something very interesting. In natural conditions, you will see what a cow needs to be a cow, what a pig needs to be a pig, what a laying hen needs to be a, a laying hen. So we can identify behavioral needs. So it's not an absolute disaster as a definition, because we can solve that. We will identify the behavioral needs of the animals. But as a universal definition of animal welfare, it doesn't work because it's not true. The natural condition is equal to animal welfare. This is not true. Five minutes more. A third definition of animal welfare is based in the function of a body. Okay. And this is related with the stress response. This means that we are living in an environment that is not uh, ensuring our survival. If we are not breathing during three minutes, we are dead. If we are not uh, uh, eating during three weeks, we are dead. If we are not drinking during three days, we are dead. The three to three. I have a joke. If you, say, you, don't, have, if you don't have sex during three months, you are married, okay? <laughs> so focus, focus in the stress response. <laughs> what you will have is that the animal, okay, is in a difficult environment, okay? And he needs to survive to this environment. This is a fighting between the animal and the environment. And the good point at this, that fighting can be assessed. There is hormones that you can assess on the animal that are telling you how this fighting between the animal and the environment is. You can assess catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, and they are giving you an idea of how this fighting is. Or you can see something like physiological indicators. Heart rate, we are using a lot in science heart rate. You have an animal here at 80 bytes per minute, and you have an animal here at 120 bytes per minute. This animal is stressed. Why? I don't know can be a lot of problems, but 120, it means that something happens. 
okay, muscular tone, other level. And then you can see the consequences, the bad consequences of the stress response. That can be dead animals, injuries, diseases, because the stress response is reduced in the immunitary system, the loss of body condition. So this third definition is the one that scientists we are working with because are giving us objective indicators. You have a 3% of mortality in your farm, you have a 7%, you have a problem. You have 3% of animals coughing, you have been 20% of animals coughing, you have a problem. You have 6% of animals with, uh, I don't know, with uh, laminis. You have a 10% of animals with laminis. He has a problem. This is something objective to assess and easy to compare. So this is usually the definition that we are using to assess animal welfare. But we have an ethical problem. When we are talking about human well-being, we are talking about emotional states. When we are talking about human welfare, animal welfare, we are talking about the stress. So we cannot use this third definition as a universal definition of animal welfare. So how we can solve this? Antonio talked about this. The Farm Animal Welfare Council decided to combine the three definitions in five freedoms. And in the 70s, they said, okay, animal welfare, animal welfare will be something like freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, blah, 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 blah. You see, here you have emotions, freedom from fear and pain, emotional state, first definition. You have freedom to express most of the normal or natural behaviors, second definition. And freedom from stress, third definition. And factors of stress, hunger and thirst, discomfort and consequences of the stress injuries and diseases. So you have here the combination of the three views, the three definitions, why? Because no one is working. The first one is the universal one, but we cannot work with them. And the last one, we are working with them, but it takes the emotions out. So we cannot work with this. During years, this was the universal definition of animal welfare, the five freedoms, but it has a big issue, a big problem in 2022. Two minutes. Imagine that I am, I am asking you for the welfare of your kids. <clears throat> How is the welfare of your kids? It's fine because they don't feel pain and they don't feel fear. During years, animal welfare was, was just that. No pain, no fear. We need to, to, to look for other emotional states. Okay, mistreating is a sense of fear and pain, yes. But animal welfare is something more. It's not just that you are not feeling pain and you are not feeling fear. So we need to evolutionate this. And this was evolutionated, evolved in the beginnings of the 20s. And one way to evolve was the Welfare Quality Project. It was an European project, very big project that said, okay, we will change the five freedoms <clears throat> for four principles, and we will include something that will be made positive emotional state. Not only pain and fear, we will consider other emotions in the animal, emotions in the animals, and if possible, positive emotions. And the same time that we are, we are doing this in the continent. In the Iceland, in the Great Britain, the Farm Animal Welfare Council, it was doing something similar. They said, okay, the five freedoms are old. We need to move this to a new concept that is a life worth living concept. What is animal welfare? And now a life worth living. <clears throat> and this includes good emotional states. And the last step on all this evolution was in 2017-16 that we had a new definition of animal welfare that said us, okay, animal welfare is good feeding, good housing, good health, appropriate behavior, and all this providing a good 
emotional state, a good mental health to the animal. So the travel that we did from the 70s until now is to talk about just pain, absence of pain and fear, to introduce appropriate behavior and positive emotional states to the place where we are now, that we accept that animal welfare, as I said at the beginning of the talk, is where? In the brain of the animal, in the emotional state of the animal. So this is all. Thanks a lot for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, otherwise we go for the coffee break. <coughs> we will be here in 15 minutes. Do you have any question? Hima. Oh, we need to put the translator. Are you there? Like Sorry, could you speak in the <coughs> microphone because the, the, uh, translator, the translator, start again. Yes. Yes. Sve, sva ova priča je lepa i ona je postala neka davno kad sam ja bio dete, ja sam tu vremešan, jela? imam preko 60 godina, tačnije 66, i to je tada bilo kada je moja porodica živjela od tri krave i tri krmače i kada je ovo, koliko ja danas imam stoke na farmi, držalo sto ljudi. Na mojoj farmi sve moje životinje su sretne, jedino sam ja u Grču. Čak pomalo i nesvetan. Kako ovo sve da primenimo da bi ta proizvodnja bila održiva? I had to say this. 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 I had to je bilo kad sam ja bio dete. Imali smo tri krave, tri krmače, moj otac nas othranio, a sad nije dovoljno 133 da bi moja porodica opstala. Je brzo, nije? Zatim, moje sve životinje su sretne, žive u humanom načinu održanja u puštenom sistemu i imaju sve slobode osim mene. Ja sam u nekom grču i ja ne imam slobodu. Ja sam zavisan od njih. Ova šanta, ova je žedna, ova traži. Ja mislim, stvarno ne znam. Sada pokušat ću kad odem kući da ih sve popuštam. Kako to funkcioniše? Nemam pojma. Moram malo se smajen simpatičan čovjek. Lepo prezentira. A onda idemo na konkretnu stvar. Empatija počinje Podrazumeva se da kad imate životinje, da imate ljubavi prema njima, ali počinje sa održivosti i održivosti naše farme. Kako je postalo, kako je sada vreme u celoj Evropi, pa i kod nas u Srbiji, Boga mi, ja sam danas ovde jedini farmer, jedini, pa uskoro neće biti ni jednog, neće biti ni jednog, nema šanse, moram. Od muke se smijem. I'm happy you are a farmer. Da, od muke se smijem zato što je jednostavno to nemoguća misija. Sve mu dovoljimo, nama ništa, zato i deca ovo neće raditi. Tu su mladi obrazovani ljudi, ne pada im na pamet u životu, ne pada im na pamet. Još ako bi čuli za ovaj zakon, završena priča, kraj.
ja slobodno sada mogu da im odem kući, čuo sam i to što pre krčmimo i završena priča. Nemoguće je to primeniti i ekologiju i dobrobit i sve, nema šansa, pa to nema šansa. Bravo, bravo, ekonomiju na prvom mestu. Pa me nije jasno da je na snazi, pa me nije to jasno, zato... Pa jesu, super, sad vidite, boći da ih vidite. Pa ja na moje farmi, samo ja imam grč. Samo ja imam životom grč. Ja sam, ne znam da sam pošao i sam došao i nekad gde da se okačim, nekada, mislim, ne, stvarno, ozbiljno vam kažem. Ovo je ekonomsko, u stvari u ovoj situaciji, sa mlekom ništa nije bolje, ni sa mesom, ni... A izvinite, molim se, imam živinarske farmi, koliko ih ima malo? Koliko ima ja? Evo sad ćete vidjeti koliko će ostaviti farmi krava. Šta je sad, ja sam dolazio iz Bečeja. Koliko ima, kako se zove, koliko sada ima svinja, koliko je bilo nekada? Koliko ima farmi? Koliko ima farmi u Bečeju sad? Dve. Dve i u Gradišću, i u Radičeviću ima jedna. Ja pričam samo u prosivnom nivou. Samo u prosivnom nivou. Jer... A kako si mislio da ja to sve sprovedem, a stoji u zakonu? Samo ti kaže, ja ću te poslušati. Ne mogu ja da vam kažem, zakonodavac je napisao šta treba da se pretrčava. Ma mi se pridižavamo i više od toga. Ne, ali vam kažem samo da ja sam ostavio iz velikog poštovanja prema ovoj kući, zato što sam i na neki način član nečega, ostavio sam posao, došao sam zbog delada i cele priče, ali ovo ja nisam mogao da skontam i ja ću sad polako da odem, zato što ja sam predstavnik i morao sam da dođem. Ali moraš da me razumeš da verovatno sam i stari. Da razumemo, mi sve, mi vas razumemo. Znamo čemu govoriš. Mi ne možemo da pomogemo. Ne, ja sam samo njima, ne, nisam rekao nama. Pa mi smo, pa gospodja, ja ju znam, znam im tačno. Mi bi sad mogli da pričamo o ovome što piše u ovim knjigicama, jel tako? O tome bi mogli da pričamo o zakominima, o veterini gde nas mogu. A mi moramo sve živo da primenimo. Ali kod nas nema šta da nas... Kontrolišite iz prostog razloga što mi ne možemo da opstanemo. Ne može, nije nam održiva proizvodnja ako ne primenimo sve ono što već ovde piše. Da li kad su u pitalju bolesti, način držanja odgoja, pa mi ako ne imamo prirast, iako ne imamo dobru genetiku, iako ne imamo sve ono što mora da se primeni u pitanju zdravlja životinja, mi ne možemo da opstanemo ovde. Mislim, ja se sad vadam, mislim, mislim, vi ste predstavnik, razumete? Govorimo o prosijalnoj farma. Da sad malo, a zbog omen. E, to je to. Ja ću zbog omen. Da. Ok. To je to. Moj les. Mogo bi još, ali sam se umorio. Ja sam zbog omen. Aj, vlastno, pivo kao. Ok, ja sam zbog omen about this. This talk today was more a general talk, but I have done in my country, and sometimes in our countries, in Portugal as well, hundreds of hours for farmers. And of all this presentation, Okay, no, I don't know if the translation is working. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have done a lot of uh, tools for farmers. In fact, usually in Spain, it's typical that farmers contract me, okay, to give a different type of tool than the tool that you received today. And from all the slides that you saw, the only one that I am putting is this one that you have in the screen. Okay, and from this one, I'm explaining how animal welfare can be. Again. Try again. Okay. Yeah, now it's working. Yeah. We have translation now. Okay, so the. Okay, so the question is that uh, the question is today. This you you saw yeah, you said that you are the, the the unique farmer here today. Okay, uh, when you are doing talks by farmers, the the way how the talk is uh, developed is different. Is different because animal welfare, okay, can be used as well 
as a tool to improve the sustainability and the uh, efficiency of a farm. And what I'm trying to say is that uh, in Spain is now in the, in the last times I'm being contracted by farmer association, associations to talk with the farmer to explain how from this slide that you are seeing here, how we can use this, okay, to improve the productivity in the agricultural farms, in pig farms, etc. Why? I, I will put a very a stupid example. But imagine that the pig is afraid of the farmer. Okay, he has just a little bit of a scare. Okay, this animal will have the hair biting higher than another pig. So imagine that a pig is with a farmer for four hours a day, okay, during a year. Four hours a day during a year, it means that the pig that is afraid of the farmer, it's 120 beats per minute. The pig that is not, it's 80 beats per minute. It's 40, 40 beats per minute, uh, the difference between being afraid of the farmer or not. In one hour, it's 2,400 beats. In four hours, it's 9,600 beats. In 100 days, this means close to 1 million of beats. In 300 days, one year, it's close to 3.5 million of bites more in this hair. Who is buying the energy that this hair needs for biting? The farmer. So if you have two pigs that are in the same farm and one is needs that the herd is biting three millions and a half more times than the other one, it's impossible that these two pigs will grow at the same level. And if they are growing at the same level, they will do it with a different uh, kilograms of food. So it means a different uh, relationship between what is winning, what is eating and what is growing. And when we are going to the details, farm to farm to farm to farm, you see that there is always ways to improve animal welfare and to see how the animal is paying for this animal welfare with a high production level. And when you are in a very nice farm where you have done everything that you could do to improve welfare, then is when you need to move to the consumer and ask to the consumer to pay for more improvements on animal welfare that is when appears the level systems to give a higher value. So animal welfare, in the first level is paid by the animals because they will produce better and the farm will be more efficient. And in the second level, when you are very high in your levels, you need to look for the people that can pay for this with a level. That is what happened in the European Union with, with a European scheme on animal welfare. I mean, I have to interrupt. I mean, yes, yeah. finish. Yeah, I mean, um... Is it okay? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry that you think that uh, me personally, I, I'm, I'm with farm every day. I know what is life in farm. So I know exactly what are, what are you talking about. And I'm, I'm sorry if you think that we are here like on the moon thinking animal welfare, something different. And it uh, doesn't work like that. I mean, improving the animal welfare in the farm will improve your productivity, will improve your product. And you're, it's going to improve the quality of your product. I mean, Tony was, was trying to explain empathy as a category, uh, something to explain the, how to assess the animal welfare, but it's not. Uh, this can be dragged into the farm level and we'll explain the, the, the augmentation of productivity in, in, in farm. So at the end of the day, you as a farmer, you're going to have a benefit out of improving your animal welfare. Da. Okay, let's go to the break. Okay, okay, okay. This is translating. This is translating. Ah, I wanted to say that it's a primary thing. Exactly what you said now, that we are using it all the time, and that it's not so. The end of the day, you can't take it. It doesn't have milk. It doesn't have milk. So. Ne postoji strah, ni jedna život ni na farmi od čoveka. Ako se to ne radi, nema uspeha u ovom poslu. Hvala. Izvinjavam se, zato je se dobio. Ok. Time for the break. Ajmo. Ajmo.
it's, it's, it's break time. Yeah, yeah. It's time for break. Sorry to. Ten minutes and uh, back here, please, 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 please. Uh, last, to last thing. A second. I mean, last thing. Please, please, fill your evaluation form. It's very important for us. Okay. You've had an evaluation form. Evaluatia something. Tarde. It's too late. It's too late. They're gone. <laughs> Hello, 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 ready to roll? Bravo. Come dici? Ladies and gentlemen. Dame i gospode, are you back? Dame, some dame, gospode. Greetings from Novi Sad to Belgrade. Translator, do you hear me? Madame. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, do, do you mind doing it for me? So we'll be listening, just me. So it's, it's a special translation for me. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know. Without Vista. Yeah. These headphones are very noisy. T people. It's much better. Okay, I think we're about to start. Can I have your attention, please? <coughs> uh, the next speaker will be the junior expert, Andreas Kaudusis who is uh, Serbian and Greek. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you. The floor Daniel. is yours. Thank you. Dakle, moj ime je Andreas Heidusis. Ja sam junior expert na za dobro bi životinje na ovom projektu. Inače sam veterinar po struci. Uh, pričam dobro srpski zašto mi je majka srpkinja, otac mi je grk, tako da ima i prezime odatle, ali sam ovde završio osnovnu gimnaziju i, i fakultet, tako da sam domaći ekspert. I ove, ja imam jedan onako možda ne, nezahvalan deo koji je predstavljanje stanja stočarstva uh, u uh, Srbiji trenutno i da povežemo nekako ovaj teorijski deo sa onim što se dešava na terenu i da vidimo koja bi to budućnost, koje su to naše mogućnosti za, za budućnost, šta bismo mogli da uradimo po tom pitanju. Uh... Op. Samo trenutak. Aha, evo ga proradio. Dakle, uh, svi ovi podaci koje ću da predstavim su iz uh, Republičkog zavoda za statistiku, uh, glavni, uh, glavne knjige koje su korišćene statistički godišnjak i zelena knjiga koju izdaje po, uh, Ministarstvo poljoprivrede, šumarstva i uh, vodoprivrede, a ovde imamo jednu anketu iz 2018. koje je Republički zavod radio uz, uz pomoć uh, EU, koji je radio jednu analizu strukture gazdinstava. E sad, pošto u pitanju anketa, 
Naravno, ljudi su odgovarali sami, popunjavali, tako da je tačnost podataka opet znači, zavisi od samog, samog, same osobe koja je popunjavala upitnik, dok s druge strane statistika je ono što, što, što imamo znači, iz godišnjaka i iz, iz ovog izveštaja. U Kruševcu, juče smo imali isto prezentaciju i imao sam prilike da pričam sa proizvođačima koji su ukazali na to da neki od ovih podataka ne predstavljaju realno stanje na terenu, da je situacija dosta gora, tako da, eto, da, da, da napomenem to, ali ka, kroz priču kad smo, kad smo razgovarali kasnije, shvatio sam da u suštini slika koju dobijamo o, iz ovoga je u suštini ista, samo što je možda oštrina malo drugačija. Ok, možda nije toliko da imamo neku bolju statističku podlogu, možda bi bila oštrija slika, ali u suštini slika je bukvalno, bukvalno ista kao što ću predstaviti. Za početak da vidimo koja je uloga poljoprivrede uopšte u, našem, u našoj državi. Mislim, stalno kažemo da je poljoprivreda jako bitna za, za Srbiju, ali u kom smislu? Konkretno poljoprivreda, od, možemo da vidimo podatke da trenutno, mislim trenutno, znači iz dve, ovo su podaci do 2020. Znači u 2020. ima doprinos od 7,8% ukupnom BDP-u. Uh, to je u odnosu recimo na neke razvijene zemlje dosta visok procena, zato što obično zemlje, na primjer, ne znam, Danska ili Nemačka imaju 1 ili 2% ili uh, udela znači, poljoprivrede u samom BDP-u. Uh, I to uh, može da predstavlja generalno razvoj ekonomije samog, uh, same države, ali bez obzira, znači opet uh, pokazuje uh, učešće, znači koliko je bitna sama poljoprivreda za, za našu državu, ali ne samo kroz ovaj procenat, nego ako dodamo primarne proizvode koje dolaze iz poljoprivrede, koje kasnije ulaze u, u, u prerađivačku industriju, dobijamo u suštini da iz poljoprivrede dobijamo preko 40% BDP, znači zbog, zbog toga. Ukupna vrednost poljoprivredne proizvodnje u 2020. godini iz točarske proizvodnje je učestvalo sa 32,5%, znači unutar tog poljoprivredne proizvodnje. I sad možemo da vidimo ovde ne samo da učestvuje sa BDP-om, nego i po broju zaposlenih. Imamo skoro 20% zaposlenih u Srbiji su u poljoprivredi. Sad to zvuči možda ovako mnogo, ali ne, vidjet ćete sada da veliki broj ljudi su, se vode kao zaposleni na svojim gazdinstvima, znači ljudi koji žive od, od svog poljoprivrednog gazdinstva. Prvo što je karakteristično jako za našu zemlju je što imamo veliki procenat raspoloživog zemljišta, odnosno površine, ovo su KPZ korišćene poljoprivredno zemljište. Čak 67% je korišćeno, pritom 8% je nekorišćeno poljoprivredno zemljište, znači zajedno im daje 75% zemljišta koje može da se obrađuje što je veliki procenat. Znači, ostalo su šume i ostalo zemljište. Od toga, 84% koriste porodična gazdinstva. I to korišćeno poljoprivredno zemljište je uglavnom ovako raspoređeno. Znači, oranice i bašte predstavljaju 74%, livade i pašnjici 19% i ovo ostalo, znači okućnica, voćnici i vinogradi, nešto manje. Čak 99,7% gazdinstava su porodična. Znači imamo samo ovaj 1,03 deo, 0,3% koje su privredna društva ili lica. I učešće, ovde vidimo sa strane, znači ovo je na ovom grafikonu ovde desno, znači ovo su podaci koje su za korišćeno poljoprivredno zemljište, broj godišnjeg radnih jedinica i standardni output. Znači koliko, pro, koliko proizvodi, koliko zapošljava ljudi i koliko zemljišta zauzima. I poenta je znači, da je skoro cela poljoprivredna proizvodnja u Srbiji organizovana na, poro, na porodičnim poljoprivrednim gazdinstvima. Od tih gazdinstava najveći deo, 53%, su meštovita gazdinstva, što znači da se bave i biljnom proizvodnjom i stočarskom proizvodnjom. Nešto manje ih je od vidimo specijalizovana samo za ratarstvo i ova su ostala koje su specijalizovana od vidimo specijalizacije znači da neka su znači sa stočarskom proizvodnjom specijalizovana samo za ovce ovci i koze neke za uh, uzgoj svinja to svinje i tako dalje ali osam od 10 gazdinstava se bavi gajanjem stoke uh, a najzastupljenija veličina stada je jedno do dva govečeta jedno do dve svinje i tri do devet ovaca 
Što se tiče specializovanih struktura u sektoru stočarstva, vidimo ovde dva ova grafikona gde se bave samo svinjarstvom 60% i ne različite kombinacije svinje i živine. Znači imamo različite kombinacije svinje i živine 60%, svinjarstvo, živinarstvo je 16,9% i svinjarstvo 22%, ne mogu sad da vidim po boji, jeste, odnosno svinjarstvo je 60%, a različite kombinacije svinje i živine su 22,7%. A što se tiče specializovanih za uzgoj goveda i ovaca, vidimo da je mlekarstvo 59%, a da je uzgoj i to goveda samo 3,4%. Ovde vidimo jednu mapu gazdinstava u Republici Srbije i vidimo da Zlatiborska oblast ima najveći broj gazdinstava, ali to ne znači ono što odmah kad pogledamo sad kao ima manje gazdinstava, manje se bave poljoprivodom ljudi u Vojvodi. Znači nije to uopšte zaključak, nego je prosečna površina poljoprivodnog zemljišta po gazdinstvu drugačija, gde u Vojvodini čak skoro tri puta veće poljoprivodno gazdinstvo nego u ostalim regionima Srbije. I ovde možemo da vidimo da je 74% u suštini su veoma mala i mala gazdinstva. To su znači vrednosti ispod 2000 evra i između 2 i 8000 evra. Što se tiče starostne strukture nosilaca porodičnih gazdinstva, ona je u proseku 61%. Ovde vidimo da preko 65 godina starosti ima čak 42% nosilaca porodičnih gazdinstva. I vidimo ovde opet učešće žena što se tiče upravnika gazdinstava, ali ovo je jedan problematičan deo, a to je iskustvo koje imaju upravnici na poljoprivrednim gazdinstvima. Odnosno, ako saberete ovde, znači imamo čak 48,6% iskustva stečeno samo praksom, 45% sa srednjom školom nekom drugom, znači ne poljoprivrednom, 6% je više škola ili fakultet, i koje je 1% je, ovde se ne vidi, zato kažem, znači 1% je poljoprivredna srednja škola i 0,2% ih je završilo neki kurs. Znači nemamo upravnike koji su fakultetski obrazovane, tako znači, bukvalno ljudi koji su stekli uskustvo radom, to nam je najveći deo upravnika. Vidimo koliko zaposlenih lica, znači daleko manje zapošljava lica kao zaposleni, nego su to članovi gazdinstva, znači porodični članovi. I osam od deset gazdinstava koristi sobstveni traktor koji je u većini slučaja, vidimo, 83% prestariji od 20 godina. Znači to nam daje jednu sliku da poljoprivreda u Srbiji je ekstenzivnog tipa. Ja bih to... Molim? Perspektivu je jedno ovako... 32% je stanje od 65 godine. To je, da. To je sad, ja pokušavam da prolazim sada kroz ove statistike da bi došao do onog glavnog dela, ali da, bilo je dosta priča o tome koliko mlade ne zanima zapravo da se bave poljoprivredom. Znači, pričao sam s poljoprivrednici i mi kažemo jednostavno moj sin ili moja čerka ide tamo u Beograd da studira, ide da, ne znam, hoće da se bavi marketingom, Instagram, ne znam, kaki crne krave, kake crne svinje, kaže, to je sramota ih je, kaže, oni nemaju više osjećaj kao da ponos, kao da kažu da se bave poljoprivredom, kaže, neće to niko da radi. I to jeste jedan veliki problem, zato što ne postoji realno neka budućnost bez poljoprivrede. Znači, mislim, to je jednostavno nemoguće. To će se raditi, samo je pitanje kako će se raditi. Sad bih prešao, znači, izvukao bih iz ovoga da je u pitanju jedan ekstenzivan tip bavljenja poljoprivredom, uglavnom. Što se tiče stočarske proizvodnje, udeo možemo da vidimo ovde u proizvodnji poljoprivrednih dobara i usluge. Ovde bih naglasio da je u pitanje Proizvodnja poljoprivnih dobara je usloga u proizvodnjačkim cenama, tako da nekako izgleda to uticalo na sam rezultat, zato što ovde ću da vam pokažem sada stočarska proizvodnja, koji je procenat udela u poljoprivrednom proizvodnju. I ovde vidimo za 2020. da je to 27,3%, a malo pre smo rekli da je isti ovaj statistički godišnjak, odakle su izvučeni ovi podaci, je napisao 32,5%. Znači imamo jednu razliku od 5% koja od nekuda dolazi, da li je zbog ovih proizvođačih cena koje su ovde stavljene ili da li su neke druge cene koristili, ne znam, ali ovo je trend koji se ovde prati, znači između 25 i 35% proizvodnje u poljoprivredi je stočarska proizvodnja. 
Što je ispod nekog trenutno svetskog, po Ujedinjenim nacijama neki trenutni svetski prosek je 40% proizvodnje je istočarske proizvodnje unutar jedne poljoprivrede. Što je, napred, što, što, što je ekonomski razvijenije, neko društvo više iskorišćava stoku, tako da, na primjer, neke zemlje u Europskoj uniji imaju 50, 60, 70% proizvodnje, poljoprivredne proizvodnje dolazi od stočarske proizvodnje. Ovde možemo da vidimo udeo, znači po kategorijama goveda, 2020 od 16%, ali ako kažemo govedarstvo, govedarstvo nisu samo tovna goveda, nego i proizvodnja mleka. Ovde vidimo da je proizvodnja mleka 2020 veća nego proizvodnja mesa, mislim, odnosno novac koji se dobije, znači vrednost. Tako da ako spojimo ove dve vrednosti, dobijemo da je znači, govedarstvo vredi oko 35% u Srbiji, ali ako primetite, postoji jedan, kasnije kad budem pričao, vidjet ćete, postoji jedan tred pada proizvodnje i broja grla goveda, vidimo da je to u kategoriji tovnih grla, a mlekarstvo je manje više stabilno. Ovde ovako kako pokazuje. Što se tiče svinja, ona predstavlja 36,6%, zatim živina koja je jednako koristi, znači manje više jednaka je proizvodnja i brojlera i uh, jaja. I na kraju nešto, nešto ovaca i koza, nešto, ali ovčarstvo pokazuje jedan trend e, rasta. To pokazivao je do sada, iako mi sada neko, baš u Krušecu sam pričao sa čovjekom, kaže ovaj, da je potpuno, e, da, da, da ljudi jednostavno napuštaju, i vidjet ćemo neke, neke tu statistike, da napuštaju e, muzne ovce, nego znači mleko, ovčije mleko je gubilo, izgubilo vrednost i da prelaze na meso koje je mnogo isplativije i mnogo je lakše uopšte za, za proizvodnju doći do, do zarade. Ovo je u suštini samo sumaci onog malo pred, da možemo da vidimo trendove šta je ono u, 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 u stočarstvu koje najviše doprinosi. To je znači e, svinjarstvo, ono uzgoj svinja i živine i govedarstvo koje ovde sad ne možemo da vidimo mleko. Znači ovo je samo goveda, svinje, živine i ovce. I ovde se beleži rast, ali opet kažem, e, ovo je sada nezgodno zato što u okviru kada ocenjujemo da li ima rasta ili nema, gledamo poslednjih par godina, a poslednjih par godina je COVID i razne, ra, razne situacije koje nam ne daju možda neku realnu sliku e, stanja. Sad ne znam, za 2021. nemam, nemam e, podatke, ali na osnovu onoga što sam čuo, nije dobro. E, ovde vidimo trend smanjenja broja e, grla i e, ovo je jedan dugoročni trend. Sad ovde vidimo od 2011. ali mi imamo... Mislim, to svi koji se bave znaju da od 1990. imamo drastičan pad u broju grla, znači i uslovne grla i generalno. I sada se beleži, znači i dalje ovaj broj goveda pada, ali kažu da stočni fond u ostalim sektorima beleži neku poboljšanje koje je u suštini stabilnost. Koliko je to istina sada, ne znam, možda će neko, neko od vas da mi kaže posle. Evo ga, pričali smo o ovome, gospodine, ovo je broj grla svaki u Srbiji trenutno, koje, koje je informacija koje imam na osnovu statističkog godišnjaka. I ovo je samo, znači, isti oni podaci iz grafikona samo u, u, u brojčanom stanju. A, što se tiče proizvodnje mesa, a, postoji trend rasta proizvodnje svinskog i živinskog mesa. Jednostavno, kad budemo pogledali, a, najviše se kod nas troši svinsko i živinsko meso i to je jedino meso koje ne zadovoljava potrebe domaće potrošnje. A postoji veliki pad proizvodnje ovčijeg mesa. Uh, goveđe meso, iako prati jedan trend pad, pad proizvodnje i uh, brojke pokazuju te, znači, je, je, su negativne u suštini i oni i dalje zadovoljavaju potrebe, znači kao da su se stabilizovali sa, sa unutrašnjim potrebama uh, naših, našeg, uh, našeg tržišta. Tako da do toga dolazi, iako pada broj grla, uh, dobar je prirast, uh, goveda se kolju na većim težinama Jednostavno, kroz taj način postoji ta zadovoljavanje potreba na našem tržištu. Znači, kroz tehnološki, u suštini na neki način, jednostavno, ne koljete goveće na manje vikilaže, nego na veće. I to je, između ostalog, možemo da vidimo ovde, po broju zaklavnih uklanicama. Znači, počeli smo sa velikim brojem, 2011. i 2012. većine goveda se klalo van klanica. I šta je nešto što se provoči između redova ovde? Kada koljete van klanica, vi koljete goveće manje težine i onda imate manji prinos. Tako da što se više kolje u klanicama, to su veća goveda i 
dobijemo, to je jedan pozitivan trend. I ovde možemo da vidimo da imamo čak pozitivan saldo, da imamo pozitivan izvoz. Tako da ne samo da zadovoljujemo naše tržište, nego čak i izvozimo. Što se tiče svinjskog mesa, imamo obrnuto stanje, a to je da naša proizvodnja ne zadovoljava naše tržište i da čak pokrivamo samo 90% poslednjih godina, sve ostalo uvozimo. Iako je ukupan broj krmača smanjen za 100.000, zbog toga što imamo veću plodnost, to se ne osjeća toliko u našoj proizvodnji. I to je opet jedna tehnološki bitna stvar. Znači, samo naglašavam za kraj ono što je bitno. Razlog zašto ljudi izbjegavaju da uđu u svinjarsku industriju jeste za nestabilnost cene i nemogućnost plasmana na većinu okolnih tržišta. I to ćemo da vidimo ovde, zato što ovde možemo da vidimo izvoz 2020. je bio nula, naravno Afrička kogu je svinja. I jednostavno ta bojazan da možda neće moći svoj proizvod da plasiraju onako kako su planirali, jednostavno ljude tera iz ovog sektora. Inače vidimo opet da pad broja je zaklanih van klanica i opet kažem razlog za to treba tražiti u smanjenju broja prasadi, a povećeno učešće utovljenika u ukupnom broju svinja. Opće i kozije meso, ukratko ću vam reći ovako da je jednostavno ono što sam malo pre već rekao, da su ljudi jednostavno proizvodjači su pronašli da im se više isplati da proizvode meso nego da proizvode mleko i ne samo to, nego je vrednost općeg mleka i potražnja je pala drastično posljednjih mislim posljednjih, ne znam posljednjih godinu dana, ali za 2019. i 2020. drastično je palo. Ja sam baš dao primjer, ja sam stalno volio da kupujem ovčiji sir u Maksiju, ima jedan belo, ono kupujemo na naša zemlja, mislim da je, ili premija. Stalno sam ga kupuo, zašto je meni najsličniji feti, feta sir u ovom gradku, feta sir je inače ovčiji kozi i sir, nema uopšte kravljeg mleka unutra, ona kravlja feta nije uopšte feta. I nema ga više, nema ga više već skoro godinu dana i baš sam se pitao šta je i onda sam video šta je u pitanju. Može da se nađe jedino mešani. Ali u ovom smislu imamo pozitivan saldo, znači izvozimo ovčije meso i zbog toga nastavlja se tendencija da se najveći broj grla zakolje izvan klanica. Znači opet vrlovatno manja gazdinstva se bave ovim ali zato, kažem, imamo taj pozitivni spoljno-trgovinski saldo. Ne znam koje je stanje sada, zato što, opet kažem, čovek koji se bavi ovčarstvom kaže da je mnogo lošije nego što ovi brojevi pokazuju. Što se tiče živinskog mesta, slično kao sa svinskim, ukupan broj živine nastavlja trend pada, iako postoji povećena potražnja koja se zadovolja uvozom, I povećanje proizvodnje je samo rezultat veće klanje živinje u industrijskom smislu. Znači jednostavno prelazi iz poljoprivrednog gazdinstva, onako iz dvorišta, prelazi u industriju više. To može da bude problem za kasnije, zato što reći ću vam opet na kraju samog, na zaključku zašto. Ovde možemo da vidimo negativan saldo, znači uvozimo, posebno uvozimo prerađevine od živinskog mesa. I ovde vidimo broj zaklanih grla živine u klanicama i van klanice. Vidimo da ta ovaj van klanica sve više i više pada. Znači van klanice to su opet gazdinstva. Što se tiče proizvoda, mleko i jaja, vidimo da meso i mleko je relativno stabilno, a ono što fluktuira ovde su proizvodnja jaja, koja zavisi direktno od broja koka nosilja koji je pada. Pa kako je pao broj koka nosilja, tako je pala i proizvodnja jaja. Što se tiče broja muznih krava, ovde piše da je stabilan i da je jednostavno ta mlekarska industrija, što se tiče mleka, da postoji ta povećena potražnja, povećena potražnja, ne potražnja, nego povećen obim otkupa kravljeg mleka, oko 5% svake godine, Ali ovde vidimo drastičan pad broja muznih ovaca, znači čak za 37% u odnosu na 2019. ali povećanje mlečnosti. I ovo je bitno, opet kažem, naglašavam tehnološki. Znači postoji način da ako biramo prave rase i ako se skoncentrišemo na, usko se skoncentrišemo na proizvodnju koju hoćemo, možemo da dobijemo veći prinos. Znači ona mašovita gazdinstva imaju 
teži, teže im je da, da, da sa jednom pramenkom da pokriju svoje potrebe za mesom i mlekom i da plasiraju na neko tržište da imaju neki, ne, neku zaradu od toga, nego ako izaberu konkretno neku rasu koja će da daje ili mleko ili meso i da se skoncentrišu na tu proizvodnju. I ovde baš, znači piše to, do povećanja mlečnosti po grlu došlo je kod ovaca za 34%, što je indikator da se polako razvoje proizvodnja mle, mesa i mleka. Uh, ovde vidimo da uh, je, postoji negativan saldo što se tiče mleka i ovo je posebno izraženo uh, za mleko i mleko u prahu, to su tarifne grupe 0401 i 0402. Što znači, sad ne znam, verovatno znači da ako imamo ovu stabilnost, da je ona regulisana u suštini i ovim uvozom. Što znači onda da proizvodimo nešto manje mleka nego što, što zadovoljava naše, naše potrebe. Naši glavni trgovinski partneri su, mislim, to nam je isto jako bitno, osim što plasiramo proizvode na naše tržište i dobijamo zaradu toga, želimo da uh, izvozimo te proizvode, I vidimo ovde da, da je glavni partner u, 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 u ovoj robnoj razmeni zemlje EU. Znači čak 47,8%, a za uvoz 63,6%. Na drugom mestu su zemlje SEFTA i onda ostali. Ovo je, ovaj desno grafikon je samo sažetak ovoga što smo pričali. Znači jedan um, uh, pogled na generalno stanje šta uvozimo, šta izvozimo. Znači vidimo da goveda izvozimo da muzne krave i krave da neko manje više tu e, stabilno i da e, čak ovde izvozimo, svinje uvozimo, živinu i jaja uvozimo i onda ovce i koze i ostali životinje izvozimo. Znači ono što imamo, e, što nam je naj... E, ako se setite onog grafikona, sad da ne vraćam skroz nazad, znači e, svinjarstvo i živina su nam na najvišem Na, na, najviše koristimo u sučarstvu, znači najviše, na, najveći doprinos dobijamo iz toga, to je ono što uvozimo. Uh, I u razlike razlik između 2012. i 2018. vidimo u diversifikaciji tržišta, znači kako za uvoz, tako i za izvoz. Znači imamo više zemalja sa kojima smo u trgovinske razmeni. E sad, uh, Sad, da zaokružujemo priču, kakve to sve veze ima sa dobrobiti životinja? Postoji jedan trend i to je skoro, mislim relativno skoro počelo ovaj u Evropi, znači postoji ovaj Green Deal, mi smo to preveli kao zeleni plan koji inkorporira, znači uključenje u to i ovaj farm to fork, to je od, od polja do stola su, 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 su preveli ovaj, naši ljudi and the cage age i ova etiketa. Znači, to su u suštini sve neke di, uh, planovi i direktive u Evropskoj uniji za budućnost, održivost. To ste čuli mnogo puta, jednostavno Evropa je jako uh, skoncentrisana na održivost, na biodiverzitet, na zaustavljanje klimatskih promjena, na zaustavljanje, uh, na, na održanje uh, životne sredine, na ukidanje antibiotika što više i pesticida, jednostavno zbog zdravlja, zbog održivosti, zbog, zbog mogućnosti, između ostalog, videli su sada tokom COVID-19 da je industrija poljoprivredna u Evropi je mnogo osjetljivija na situacije, na, na krizne situacije kao što je COVID. I sve to zajedno, u čitavoj toj priči veliku ulogu ima dobrobit životinja. E sad dobrobit životinja možete da pogledate, recimo na neki način, možete pogledati tri, mislim nekako u mojoj glavi su tri stvari. Jedan je da jednostavno sami građani zahtevaju da se bolje obhodimo prema životinjima, da, da životinje imaju dobrobit, ajmo recimo tako. Znači jednostavno to je nešto što da bi se zadovoljili sami građani. Drugo je da dobrobit životinja, što je rekao kolega, stvarno može da pomogne proizvođačima u nekim segmentima da dobiju bolji proizvod. Znači, ne samo da bude veće, može da bude i veća proizvodnja, ali može da bude i kvalitetniji proizvod. Znači, jednostavno da ima, ne znam, za svinju da ima više masti, da bude veći priraz, da bude veći, ne znam, da, da meso bude mekše, da ne bude, znate, ako, na primjer, imate problem, imate ono um, vodnikavo, vodnikavo meso kod svinja ili od stresa i tako da, znači, da izbjegnete take stvari. Um, treća stvar jeste ekonomska isplativost. Odnosno da ovo su sve uh, uh, 
svi ovi planovi koje Evropa pravi za budućnost, da pređe sa intenzivnom na ekstenzivnim načinom uzgoja, posebno u stočarstvu, ali generalno za sve, za održivu, znači, održivost i za energiju, znači da pređu sa fosilnih goriva na, na, na održive energije i tako dalje i tako dalje. Sve će to da prođe u zakonodavstvu. I kada prođe u zakonodavstvo, jednostavno niko neće moći da radi drugačije, nego će jednostavno biti svima naređeno, da, ne, mislim, da, se, da, 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 da tako rade. Između ostalog, ovo od polja do stola ima za cilj da prepozna, to je da žele da daju fair, s jedne strane daju zdrav i održiv, održivu proizvodnju, znači hranu za konzumere, za, 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 za potrošače, ali s druge strane žele da nagrade, ne da nagrade, nego da daju fair cenu primarnim proizvođačima, zašto su uvideli da trenutno stanje u, 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 u poljoprivredi, u industriji, znači nije fair prema primarnim proizvođačima, najviše ide na, na, na prodavce, na retailere, na velike, na velike lance. Tako da će postoji plan, ali da bi se zaštitio taj poljoprivrednik budućnosti u Evropi, uh, oni će da uvedu ista pravila i za sve uvoze i za sve izvoze. Što znači da neće, neće moći iz, tre, iz zemlje trećeg sveta da se uveze neko grlo koje je gajeno po drugim uslovima ili neki proizvod koji je pravljen po drugim uslovima. I to, tu dolaze ove etikete, naprimo, ova etiketa je iz Francuske. Francuska i Španije su već uvele ove etikete, ovo je, ocenjuje dobrobit životinje iz svijeta. Od A do, do D, znači A, B, C, D, koliko je visoko zadovoljena dobrobit životinja. I onda sami potrošači mogu da izaberu da li hoće proizvod koji je više animal friendly ili, ili manje. Uh, čak pre nego što dođe do tog implementacije tog zakonodavstva. Recimo kažemo sada ovaj NDKJ je jako bitna stvar, a to je da se, da se ukinu uh, svi kavezi za životinje. Znači za, za početak sada 2023. Uh, 2021. je nastala ta građanska inicijativa. Dve, uh, Evropska komisija je prihvatila i rekla je da će dati odgovor do 2023. kada će to da se krene da se primenjuje i da daju, na primjer, neki uh, pravni okvir. Ali, uh, iako možda možemo da razmišljamo kao proizvođači, aha, dobro, ok, to će možda biti 2027. pa još neka godina, pa 2030. pa ok, imam ja još šanse da ja tu ovaj, radim kako radim, ove etikete mogu da predstave drugačiji problem gde... Uh, je ovo nije vezano zakonodavstvo, nego ovo, mogu, ovo su mogu da budu MVO ili, ili uh, privatna, privatna društva. Znači, uh, ako reši jedan Lidl ili jedan Tempo da bude animal friendly, jednostavno da, da bi prikupio više kupaca, on može da kaže ja kupujem samo proizvode koji imaju ovo etiketu i onda mogu da vide drugi to i da krenu isto to da rade i da onda pre nego što uopšte postoji zakonodavstvo koje... Pro koje propisuje da vi ne možete da izvezete neki proizvod u Evropsku uniju, da vama sama kompanija kaže, ok, da, znači imate vi pravo, ali ja to neću da otkupim od vas zato što ja samo hoću da prodajem animal friendly ovaj, proizvode. I vama se zaključuje to tržište ne za deset godine, nego za godinu dan ili za dve godine. E, to je opasnost. A pritom su stvari šta? Da se vrate, ono što oni pričaju jeste da se vrate iz intenzivnog uzgoja, znači iz tog industrijskog na ekstenziva uzgoj, nešto što mi već u suštini imamo. I način na koji će doći do toga jeste kroz nova naučna saznanja i kroz nove primene tehnologije koje su tipa adaptirane za održivost. Znači nešto što mi možemo mnogo lakše da, 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 da primenimo nego da izgradimo fabriku. Znači, znači, nije to u tom smislu kao glađenje fabrike, nego bukvalno naučno saznanje kako da na samoj farmi, u nekim prirodnim uslovima, na osnovu podataka koje dobijamo od životinja, znači podaci zasnovani na životinjama, da napravimo sredinu koja će njima odgovarati i da imamo pritom proizvodnju, koje posle možemo, da kažemo recimo organska proizvodnja, koja je kod nas Sad je nezahvalno zašto su tri godine koje su u krizi, ali vidimo da je postao drastičan skok u proizvodnji. Recimo evo samo živine od 6.000 na 17.000 u roku od godinu dana. Znači postoji neko tržište za tu organsku proizvodnju. I ako bi, na primer, ne znam, recimo kod nas je Zlatiborac poznat, svi znate za Zlatiborac, odlični, odlični proizvodi. Ako bi, na primer, ili, ili neki drugi. Molim? 
Da li ti morat za? Da, možda je, možda je, da. Ne, ne, nisam rekao najbolje. Ne, 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 nisam rekao najbolje. Rekao sam da su dobri proizvodi. Da, ne. Ne, 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 rekao sam. Ne, 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 ok, ne ukažem, mislim sam, poenta je brendiranje. Poenta je brendiranje. Znači, ideja je da vi imate Zlatiborski okrug, da vi možete da slikate, recimo, tamo planine i šumu, da kažete, evo, ta životinja je bila tu, organska proizvodnja, ne znam, kao što su radili za alpsko mleko. Znači, vi imate, kad kažete, alpsko mleko i alpske krave ili milka, vi uvek imate u glavi ideju, znači, one planine, pa travica, pa tako, i to je jednostavno posle jedan potrošač u Evropi može da kaže, aha, organska proizvodnja iz Srbije koja ima lepu prirodu i vidi slike, kaže, aha, to je super. Kao što je Antonio pričao, plasiranje proizvoda sa jednom pričom iza toga, to je kao specialitet. I onda možete da dobijete vrednost za taj proizvod. Onda hoće kupac da kupi taj proizvod. I posebno ako se otvori jedno tržište, kao što je Evropska unija, gde već sami, videli ste pone statistice, sami građani Evropske unije zahtevaju tako nešto i kaže, ok, platit ćemo više. O tome će nešto više pričati kolega Antonija. Onda imate mogućnost da napravimo, u moje glave je to, da se napravi jedan kao prečica, umesto da idemo kao Evropska unija, od ekstenzivnog na intenzivan, pa da onda kažemo, aha, malo smo zalutili, ajde da se vratimo nazad na ekstenzivan, ali sa promenama, ajde mi odmah ovaj ekstenzivan sada što imamo, koji nije naravno apsolutno daleko da je odidelan, ajde mi taj da adaptiramo, da ga ne guramo u intenzivan. Hvala. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any question? It looks like you have. No, it's okay. No, it's fine. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Ciao, big farmer. Have a good day. And next presentation will be Tony Dalmau again about how to develop a protocol. Yes. yes. Sure. And there's a change of program. Um, uh, Tony will be the last speaker before the lunch break. So my presentation on labeling will be just after lunch, if you will have the patience to wait. Yes, so this is we'll... the last uh, half an hour, and then we go for lunch break. Yeah, we will do now a talk of 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, we will go to take lunch, OK? So, this talk is about development of animal welfare and animal welfare protocol. Sorry, it's not moving. Why? I don't know why. Now. Now. Okay, the first question. I will, I will do several questions today. Okay, I will try to answer all the questions. Okay, and the first question is, when we are developing a protocol, is what we want to assess. And it's very similar to what we talked this morning. What do you want to assess? You want to assess risk factors or you want to assess animal welfare? Okay, risk factors, you know, it's where the animals live. Usually when you are doing the regulations, the legislation on animal welfare and the regulation that you will, uh, you will adapt from the European Union is all based in inputs, all based in risk factors. Don't put uh, light more than I don't know how many looks. Uh, eight hours of uh, light for day. Uh, take care with the floor because the size of the floor must be, I don't know. And you need to have fans because reducing the temperature. You need to have uh, clean walls. You need to have a space allowance of X square meters per animals. You need to, you need to not uh, tail docking or you need not to uh, do castration without anesthesia after seven days. All these are inputs things that are around the animals, what you are doing with the animals, what you are putting to the animals. Okay, so resource and management based measures. And if you are using this, what you will have is a protocol that will be used as a guideline, a good practices guideline. What you need to do, what you need not to do, what you need to provide to the animals, what you don't need to provide to the animals to improve their welfare. But you are not assessing welfare when you are using a good uh, practices guideline. You are just taking information from the literature review that you know that have the potential to increase the welfare of the animals. But this is just only a potential 
increase the welfare. You are not assessing welfare. If you want to assess welfare, you need to move to another type of measures that are animal-based measures, measures taken on the animals. Okay, if you want to see how an animal is, you need to check the animals. Why, which is the advantage of the animal-based protocols? The advantage is that you can use it in a lot of places in several countries. A lame cow is a lame cow in Brazil and in Finland. It's the same. But in Brazil, probably you, you will need some, something to reduce the temperature inputs. And in Finland, probably you will need some heating to increase the temperatures inputs. So the inputs are very different and differs a lot between systems, between countries, between it's not the same in extensive systems and in intensive systems. It's not the same in, I don't know, in farrowing sows that in growing pigs. Okay, it will differ a lot between different countries and systems. The outputs are not differing. An animal has a diarrhea in the same way in Serbia than in Spain. And an animal is cooking in the same way in Serbia than in Spain. The animal-based measures can be used worldwide because you are assessing animal and the animal will behave and will have clinical problems and will have in the same way in, 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 every, in every place. So it's always when we are assessing animal welfare, we will try to work with animal-based measures. This is the first decision. We want to do a good practice guideline or we want to do an animal welfare protocol. Animal welfare protocol will need to use animal-based measures, measures assessed on the animals. So the next question is, okay, how I will structure my protocol? Okay, so, okay let's, let's do a protocol of animal welfare. Okay, uh, how I begin? What I'm doing, okay, uh, the animal have a disease, yes, and what more? How I can use? So you need an a structure, and you have structures to work in different, in different places from different projects. One possible structure is the five freedoms. It's a very old structure. I don't like it. I explained to you that for scientists, this is too old. and We need to advance in another way, but can be used as an structure for developing a protocol on animal welfare, five freedoms. Freedom one, absence of hunger and thirst. What I will use as a parameter to assess absence of hunger and thirst. Second principle, no? Absence of thermal uh, and physical discomfort. What I can assess to, mm, to, to ascertain if the animal is in absence of thermal or physical discomfort. This can be an option. Another option, I like, I prefer this one, it's more modern, okay? It's a welfare quality protocol. That is another structure that is telling you something very simple. For hundreds of years for a farmer, animal welfare was feeding, housing, health. Animal well-fed, animal well-housed, animal without diseases. So this is very sounding for a farmer. This is very sounding for the society in general. And the scientist said, okay, and now please put another leg that is appropriate behavior. And you have a good structure of what animal welfare is. A good feeling, a good housing, a good health, and appropriate behavior. But how I can work with this for worse? Let's define what is a good feeling. It means that the animal is not feeling hunger. It means that the animal is not feeling thirst. What it means a good housing. Okay, the animal, when they wants to move, they need to have free of movement. When they don't want to move, they must be comfortable while it's resting. So comfort around resting is of movement and environmental temperature. So thermal comfort. This is a good housing. What is good health? No injuries, no diseases and no pain induced by management. What is pain induced by management? Castration, tail docking, the beaking, uh, killing without a good stunning, etc. This can produce pain just because management of humans. 
And then appropriate behavior. Our species are all social species, cows, sheep, dogs, uh, all of them are social species, uh, horses, all of them. So one inappropriate behavior, one of the things that we're gonna check, and this afternoon we will see some examples of this, okay, is just social behavior, which is the probability of when you are in a farm, how many times you have a good social behavior, good social contact between animals, and how many times you have a bad social contact between animals. And this is a very nice indicator to see if you have competition for resources. It's very, very, it's very nice to go, for instance, a dairy cattle farm and to see how animals are fighting the drinkers, what it means that the drinkers are not well designed. And you see that the animals are wow, wow, headbutt here, headbutt there, displacement here, displacement here. Why? Because the drinkers are not well designed. And it's funny because for dairy cattle, for dairy cattle, the only rule to produce milk is to provide good food and a lot of water, a lot of water. If you want to make milk, you need a lot of water. If not, you will not produce water. Well, one of the main problems in dairy cattle farms is competition for water. Why? Because they don't have enough water. No, because they are designing the farms, not thinking in the animals, thinking in humans. And this is a big issue. A second principle is expression of all the behaviors that here is the behavioral needs that we talked before. For ruminants, for instance, going to the pasture or rumination. For pigs, exploration of the environment is a, is a, is a behavioral need. For laying hands, dust batting is a behavioral need. So behavioral needs that are important for the animals. These animals are with humans, youth, human, animal relationship. They need to be not scared of humans because they are working with humans all day. So a good human animal relationship. And then we talk about this this morning, a positive emotional state. First point, absence of fear, absence of general fear, but then a general positive emotional state, animal that is in a good mood. And this can be assessed as well. Okay, not in an objective way, but we have some approach. We will talk this afternoon about how we are approaching to this mood state in the animals. That is something more or less new in science, but we are going this way. So once we have the structure, we decided how five freedoms, four principles, five criteria with for quality on any, no, any other that you decide. No, I decided to use just three points at least, uh, I don't know. But once you have the structure, you can go to see how I will put the measures inside this estimator. I like this one because anything that can happen to an animal is inside one of these 12 criteria, anything. With this in mind, you never will forget anything that can happen to an animal in a specific scenario. We are using this, for instance, EPSA is using this for risk analysis. In my risk analysis is okay. Let's imagine that we have a transportation of pigs in summer uh, of eight hours in Spain at 35 degrees. Okay, let's see which are the problems that we can have with our animals. We can use this. Okay, so in terms of absence of, of prolonged hunger, okay, eight hours is not a problem, upset if we are doing a fasting period in the farm of more than blah, 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 blah. So you can go very, very well step by step with this structure to identify risk factors for the animal. So it's, it's very useful, this structure, because it's difficult that you forget something if you are using this. So the first thing is we have a data structure. Now, the second point is, okay, when we will look for the measures that we will use inside this data structure, what we will use, experts or science? And I am doing a big difference between that expert of science. Because there are different things, okay? I, am, I can be an expert and I am a scientist, okay? But sometimes we're abusing of the scientist and we are abusing of the experts. I'm not clever than any other people in the world. I'm just working in something that this is the scientific methodology. A scientist is somebody that is working in the scientific methodology and he knows what he has read or what he has tested 
using the scientific methodology. So this idea that I can have a group of experts, a group of scientists, close them in a room, and then can decide what is animal welfare. This is good in the 70s, not now. Science is another thing. So science is to go to see a paper and to see that this paper was repeated for all the five people and they find the same results. And then you can know that this is science in the real life. It's not a group of people that they think that they are God. They are professors of the university and they can stay in a room and they can decide what animal welfare is. This is not true. And this is a big mistake. And this is something that still is happening in some places now in Spain. In some areas, they think that they can just select four or five experts and these experts will decide what animal welfare. No, science is not this. Science is going to what is doing the science community around the world and how they are seeing, defining things. And sometimes the scientific methodology will say, yes, yes, this is the right way. Sometimes we'll say, no, this is not the right way. This is the scientific methodology. We are just workers of the scientific methodology. We are not clever than any other. Okay, you just, you just, we are just experts in using one tool. This is a scientist. It's not nothing more than this. Just an expert in a tool. And when we are leaving the tool outside, we are close to nothing. Okay, so this is something that we need to understand. Use Validated science or use expert committees. I prefer, of course, use validated science. With validated science, then we will need to look for these measures, these parameters that we will use in this structure of four principles and 12 criteria. And we'll talk about four words, difficult words. Okay, validity, reliability, feasibility, and repeatability. And we will work in these four words to decide how or which measures we will use. How we will, be, we will begin, okay, for validity. What is validity? Validity is that what you think that you are assessing is really what you are assessing. This is the validity of a measure. I put an example that it's, it's, it's a real example because we have this in the web for quality protocols, that is diarrhea. Imagine that you have two farms. In one farm, the animals are very scared of humans, very bad human-animal relationship. And in the second farm, the cows are very close to humans. Okay, the cows have name and the, the, there is a very close contact from the farmer and humans with these animals. And in the two farms, we have a problem of diarrhea. The same, exactly the same problem of diarrhea. They are close and they have the same virus and they have the same frequency of problems of diarrhea. And now you have, you are the assessor and you are arriving to the farm and you're arriving to the first farm. And as they are scared of humans, when you are just entering for the door, all the, all the cows are being, <laughs> and you, wow, there is a lot of diarrhea here. 80% of the animals with diarrhea. And you're going to the farm and the animals are going to you, and are, 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 are going close and nobody is defecating, just one animal probably. Yes by random and you see okay here one person of diarrhea here 80 percent of diarrhea this is a valid measure no there is a confounding factor that is the human animal relationship this is something that we find in the web for quality when we are doing or when we are asking somebody to go to a farm to assess diarrhea we cannot use these parameters in this way we cannot ask to the, to, the, to the observer, okay, wait 20 minutes and see the animals that are defecating if they are on the area or not, and then this is not working. Why? Because it's not a valid measure. So how we can validate this? Or how we did it with for quality? We decided that the animals with diarrhea is, a di is an animal that is dirty around the anus, one hand in one side and one hand in another side. And you say, oh, this seems stupid. Yeah, but this works better to find a farm with diarrhea than the other one. The other one is good for beds. A bed that is going every week, every two weeks to a farm and is seeing and knows the farm, knows the animals, etc. 
it's good that, okay, oh, wow. In fact, you know, beds can smell the diarrhea. When you are in a farm and there is diarrhea, you are just entering. Okay, here there is the diarrhea. Okay, you, you will smell it. Okay, but for an assessor, an external assessor, okay, you need something different. You need to validate a measure in another way. When you don't have valid measures, you need to validate it. And here is when you have the scientific method methodology. This is a study that I did in 2006, six, yeah, 2006 for welfare quality. And we were trying to validate measures in pigs to assess fearfulness, okay? How fair an animal was in a new environment. This was trying to assess, for instance, which is the reaction of the animal when was being unloaded in a slaughterhouse and they was scared of the situation. What we did, we put a pig alone inside a pen. This is something that he doesn't, he doesn't like, but after some days, the animal will be used to this. We put a feeder inside the pen and inside the feeder we put apples in small pieces. Pigs enjoy a lot the, the apples in the small pieces. So what we did is, okay, when the pig was entering, the feeder was closed during 30 seconds and then zoop, was open and the animal had the, had the apples and was, uh, could eat the apples during two minutes. And after that, the animal was taken, was, was taken out. This, you are doing this during one, two weeks after the animal is trained. And when the animal is trained, it means that when you are putting the pig inside, wow, it's going very fast to the feeder and waiting that you are open. When you are open, it's eating. The, this is an animal trainer. Now it's arrived the day of the test. And the day of the test is that you will put inside the feeder something new for the animal that can be a ball as this one that you can see here, something new. This pig that you have here is the first time that he will see the ball and this pig of the other side is the first time that he will see the pole. These two animals are living in the same pen. They were, in they, are, they were housed in pens of two animals. They were in the same pen, the same hour. You see the first one at 3.25, the second one at 3.29, the same. But the animal in this side, we try to reduce the fearfulness. The animal in the other side is an animal without any treatment against fearfulness. We will see the difference when an animal is seen by first time a ball. First, an animal without fear. It's, it's waiting that we are open the door. Now it's going to the apple and now, oh, a ball. I'm not fear, so I am exploring the ball. Something new, I want to touch, I want to play with the ball. After some seconds, she will remember that he has only two minutes to eat apples. And we say, okay, okay, let's go to eat apples, because if not, I will not eat apples. And now he's eating apples. This is an animal without fear. And I will see an animal with fear. This is open a little bit later just to see the ball, okay? But you see that the first reaction is, I'm a stop, okay, I'm going, and now I'm sniffing the floor. Nervous, okay, I'm seeing the ball again, no. Again, sniffing the, wall, and sniffing the floor, oh, again to the ball, no, no. Let's see, the door is open or not, no. I will jump, let's see, no. Okay, I will try it again, slowly, slowly. No, 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 no. Okay, here, no, let's see if I can jump here. No, okay, again. This is, was the behavior of 30 pigs. One after one after one was always that. Animals with fear, a lot of activity, retreat attempts, turning back and reluctant to move. That were the behaviors that we could validate because we had a test in which we had animals without fear and animals with fear. You know what we did with the animals without fear? Just a drag, midazolam an anxiolytic, so the animal was without fear. And the other one was a control animal. Combining both, you can validate a measure. We validated this measure just in this way. This is a way to validate a measure. 
Then the next question is, they are reliable? Is the reliability of a measure? It means in different conditions will work in the same way. Imagine this is Iberian peak, okay? The Iberian peak is not this, this is cattle, okay? The big ones behind are cows, okay? The pigs are just taking a bath here and walking. This is Iberian peak, okay? Extensive systems. We take this breed and we have this breed in Spain, read it extensive and read it intensive. So we take the same breed and we see, we saw if with the measures that we validated for exploring positive and negative social behavior, we're using the same way in extensive and intensive system. The measure was working. The difference is that in intensive systems, they are performing more positive behavior and more negative behavior, but the relationship between positive and negative was maintained. So this would a good proof of reliability of this measure. So in two different systems, the measure can be achieved, can be done, and the relationship is more or less maintained. What is feasibility? I put here an example of feasibility, but there is another that is more clear. Imagine that you want to know the, uh, the level of hydration of an animal in a farm. You can take a blood and you can assess the hematocrit. But for this, you need to go to a laboratory or you need to have, this is not feasible. There are some measures that are not feasible. In this case, what I put it here is, a, is an unloading area in the slaughterhouse. And we validated one measure that was vocalizations, but these vocalizations should be assessed at the same time that, that assessing if the animals were sleeping and falling and if the animals were uh, was panting and if the animals have difficulties walking. It's impossible to make everything and vocalizations. So in this case, the problem of feasibility was that it was impossible for the people to do it in these conditions. But the measure is valid and the measure is reliable, but is not feasible in the conditions that you want to use it. So it's another thing that you need to assess when you are looking for measures in a protocol, the feasibility. And finally, the repeatability, inter-repeatability and intra, inter-repeatability, sorry, and intra-repeatability. This is funny because sometimes we had some parameters. Imagine in dairy cattle, for instance, this is an example of, of laminis, laminis on dairy cattle. In, in dairy cattle, you can use the scales of 10 degrees of lame animals, 10 degrees. And you can train, train people for two hours in the 10 degrees, and you can ask uh, some boy, okay, you see the cow, how is working now? He will say 1.5, okay, perfect. And you see, you take the same cow three hours later. Okay, now, how is working the animal? Uh, 2.5, this is about repeatability. This is not consistent. The cow has the same problem in the morning than in the afternoon. So if you are scoring different in the morning and in the afternoon, it's because the problem is yours. And probably it's because the problem is the measure. So there is a general rule. If you want very few people with a high expertise in something, you need to look for these scales with a lot, a lot of grades. One, 1 1.5, 2, 2.5, etc. If you want that your protocol is used for a lot of people in a more easy way, even for farmers, you need to reduce the categories. You need to put very, very, very few categories and very clear categories. What is laminis? Laminis in dairy cattle is when you have an abnormal rim in the way they are walking as the right, left, uh, in quarter leg. An abnormal rim, that's the, the, the speed of one leg is tack and the other is tack, tack is shorter. Okay, this is a moderate lamb. And this is something that you can train. And this is a severe lamb, an animal that is putting a minimum weight beating in one leg. That is, this is a very clear case, okay, of animal with laminis. So one of the points, if you want to do a protocol is to look for repetibility measures that can be done for different people in a good way that 
this man and me seeing the same animal, we will have the same score. If not, this will never will work. So good repetibility is between me and others and between me and myself when I will see the same animals. This is another key point when we are developing measures for a protocol. I'm finishing. Huh? So how we can, the next question is how to ensure robustness. Once we have the protocol, the structure and the measures, how I can ensure that everybody will do it in the same way? Very easy, a good training program. A training program that consists in three different things. First, very clear rules. What is good, what is bad, very clear. What is lame and what is not lame? What is lame moderate, what is lame severe? Very clear rules. Second, images and videos showing examples. Examples of typical problems and examples of rare problems that you will not find in, a, in most of the farms, but that the observer can find someday in one farm. And third, going to a farm and checking real animals and showing how to process it in real animals. And finally, doing an examination. An examination of the three parts, the, the rules, the images, and how you are developing the protocol in a farm. In web quality, for instance, a protocol for dairy cattle takes the training five days, from eight in the morning to five in the afternoon. And the, the last day you have an exam in the farm, you have an exam with images, you need to score the images as is scored by the expert. And another exam that is about the rules, write an exam. This is the way to have a good robustness. The next step is thresholds. Okay, I know that I and now I know that I will assess laminis, but what is good or what is bad? You have a three person of laminis, this is good or bad? You have a five person, this is what? Which score I will give to somebody that have one person of animals with laminis or somebody with three person of laminis? How to do this? Again, if you have in the literature somebody that have solved this problem, take it. If not, you need to do it. One way that we are using to do this is just to make a picture of the situation. Let's go to Serbia. Let's check 100 farms of dairy cattle. And let's see which is the situation. One person to imagine you have 100 farms, you have one farm, or you have 100 farms, I don't know, three farms with a zero person of laminis, two farms with one person, three farms with uh, two person, three person, five, seven, 12, 25, 29, 77. Okay, you put in order and then you decide, okay, the 10 best farms will decide the first threshold for the excellence. The 10 person best farms will be the excellence. So if I have 100 farms, and the 10 first farms they have, the last one have a 1.5% of laminis, my excellence will be in 1.5. And my sufficient will be the 30% of the rest of the farms. And if the cut is in 2.5% in of laminis, this will be the second threshold. And after five years, I will change this because probably as I'm pushing the farms that are lower to arrive to 2.5, these ones will move on top and these ones will move on top. So probably you will able to apply a continuous improvement because in some years you will can decide, okay, now the excellent is not 1.5, it's 1% of animals with laminates. This is a way to work with this. And usually you are using experts. You are using a picture of the situation and some experts to discuss how to do it. The same when you are combining two measures, moderate and severe laminis, which is the relationship. Severe is two times worse than moderate or it's four times worse than moderate or 10 times worse than moderate. This is something that needs to be decided in this case as well by experts. And finally, how you will combine these, all these measures to have a final score on the farm. And how you will assess this farm. 
which is the approval for the farm. It's in 55 points, in 60, in 70, in 100. And here you will do something similar. You will check the protocol in your, in your area. You will see where you are and you will decide where you can put the cutoff to approve. And after some years, you will move or this or the thresholds of the measures that are, are giving you, are, are helping you to arrive into the final, to this final score. And finally, the last question is how to explain this in an easy way. You know, it's complicated to develop an animal welfare protocol. I tried to do it in 30, in 30 minutes. Okay, but the idea is this one, select good measures, that these measures are valid, validated, reliable, feasible, and repeatable. Okay, and you have a way to combine all these measures to have a final score for your farm. This is how we are developing animal welfare protocols when they are based in animal-based measures. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. If the, there's any questions, otherwise we go for lunch. And um, we have one hour and then we'll see you back here. Do you have any questions? Da, 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 da. Okay. Seems not. Okay, good. good uh, have a good lunch. See you soon. I guess the lunch will be in the same room that we were for the coffee. I don't know. Hello, 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 hello. It's two o'clock. Welcome back. Fed and uh, and not drunk, but I mean. Shall we start? Is anybody here? Okay, then I then we start it off. So we'll be finished as soon as possible. And you will be free to to do your stuff. Uh, is the translation online? Okay. May I have your attention, gentlemen and ladies, please. Tony. Okay, we will be talking about a little bit what is the perception of the Europe of the public. Oh yeah, I have to remember, please. Re Feel the evaluation form that you have. Please feel it if you have not done yet. Please do it because we need to have that evaluation back correctly filled and signed. Thank you very much, Palapuno. Okay, we will be talking now about <clears throat> the animal welfare, the different animal welfare approved scheme. So we were, we were talking about uh, how to highlight what we have in our program. What is the animal welfare? How can we uh, present our product? Well, well, it's very simple. I mean, we have to label with a label which is clear and is clearly stated that is uh, derived from animal welfare certified scheme or there's some animal welfare certification inside. Uh, if you go Google it and you go and find it, there are plenty and has been many, many years since they started to, to go out with new label, animal welfare friendly labeling systems in different country inside and outside Europe. Uh, in, Euro, in, uh, in, in Europe, within the European <laughs> Union, there's only a compulsory system for labeling related to animal welfare and it's about the legislation of laying hands. So, so it's about the quote. Oh, what am I? No. What did I do? Let's go back. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, this is a requirement by law. This this um, these eggs are produced 
with the highest welfare standards. And you can write it down, the, you're allowed by law in European Union. Most of the other brands are voluntary and they are not regulated by legislation. Uh, there's plenty of, uh, of uh, scheme that could be applied in, uh, especially in the poultry meat industry, um, applied on welfare, but also in other, in other category of meat. Uh, we, we, we talked before about the organic farming rules. Uh, the organic farming rules are regulated in the EU uh, with, a, with a legislation and they have, uh, they have a very, very clear logo. And the organic farming is also in, inside their principle. They, they do believe that uh, they have some space for, for uh, animal welfare. So it can be used in together as a share like organic and animal welfare and if you can see this logo this is the logo that is uh, compulsory if you apply to the scheme can be used only in product they have they, they undergone um, many control and checks and evaluations to to have this logo and this is logo now is very famous and is quite clear in many in many many products i don't know if you see in, in serbia but i believe you have plenty of the product with this logo coming from European Union. To, to, to better, if for you to better understand what is labeling and what I would like to show you some result of this uh, publication that is, uh, was published in on 2022 and is in a study on animal welfare labeling was a final report. And we'll go very briefly because I, I would like you to understand uh, the importance for the citizens, for the common people and what do they think and, and what could be the best move for Serbia that is approaching this world, not to make the mistakes that we already did in the uh, European Union. So the study was made on, out of uh, uh, a survey, a survey uh, on, on a, a huge, a huge sample of population. And the first question was asking, uh, what if, um, how many people would be interested if there's uh, going to be a, uh, in the food packaging, some information on animal welfare? If you can see here, I mean, uh, dark blue is everyone, uh, uh, blue uh, is a majority, uh, light uh, blue is uh, uh, half, uh, very light blue, no one, and the gray is, is don't know. So the 81 here is, uh, it says, for example, the sum of the, the, the positive responses. If you see here, it's very interesting that France has a share of 15% of people responding to say that they are everyone who could be very much interested in having a labeling in, in the product. Whereas in Estonia, 18% of the people, nearly one out of uh, five per, per person, they were not interested at all in labeling. So there's a, and you can see here, there are this, you know, from Finland and Estonia, from, from France, they are not, uh, they're not divided as they used to be like the importance, North, South, East and West country. They're very scattered. The answer were quite, com quite different compared <laughs> to the nation. Then it was asked, um, what is the organization that you would trust the most in uh, assuring an animal welfare quality scheme? Uh, like it would be charity, like an NGO, the European in, uh, Union itself, uh, the public authorities, uh, association of producers and retail, association of retailers. As you can see here, uh, public authorities, they're not very, they're, they're not trust at all meaning that uh, for some reason, the public is perceiving ourselves, because I'm, I'm the public authority, for example, in Italy, they're perceiving us not very reliable on assurance the scheme. Uh, while, for example, we have that 25, one, one person out of four, they believe that the NGO could be in charge of this, uh, of this uh, insurance scheme. Uh, <laughs> Then we then was asked how important could be uh, in, within the following factors, uh, scoring from one to five, when five is very important and one is not at all important. What are the factors that are very much important for animal welfare? 
And the least is 3.9 is whether the animal can interact with other animals. And this is like, uh, uh, I'm sorry for, for, for Tony, but uh, the common people believe that interaction between animals, they're not very important uh, on an animal welfare point of view as perceived by human being. Uh, quite high is how, how the animal is handled. You see it's 4.3, seems to be quite high. Of course, health, the health and uh, the access to food and water are on the top, and this is quite understandable. While, as I was saying to say to you before, I mean, uh, we can we can give information in, in the labeling system as an organic and, and animal welfare point of view. So uh, um, the, the survey asked to the people, how uh, are they also interested in receiving other information? There are very important issues. So the majority of the respondents, like 76, 67%, they were concerned about the use of antibiotics. Again, again the, the problem of residues in meats, in meat and animal product is a very important problem and is very, uh, how do you say, is a, is a hot topic for the, for the public, the general public in Europe. And um, as you can see, 67%. Therefore, uh, uh, the consumers, they want to know a, a lot of information about how animals uh, have been if the animals have been received uh, antibiotics or not, and this is very important because this is a health issue, a human health issue. Then um, was asked what was the best way to provide uh, information about animal welfare in the product that you normally buy. Uh, Fifty-eight percent of the population of the respondent, they say that should be a text on the on the packaging of the product. Uh, 57, so more or less, is the same stuff. Could be only a logo, just some clear logo, some form of uh, uh, nice appealing uh, image should be uh, branded on, on, the, on the packaging. Other people said that QR code can be used. Uh, others suggest that the mobile app could be used in the identification of the product. The 15% of the respondents also believe that social media could be used in, uh, in, in the promoting the animal welfare friendly product. And 26% also believe that a dedicated web website which provide information on food brands could be useful for, to promote these things. So uh, the consumers, they do perceive the information on animal welfare could be on a, on, a, on, a, on a labeling mainly, but also other source of media. Interaction could be uh, a, a good way to promote, um, to promote the animal welfare. Also, also a combination of logo plus other media um, systems. Uh, then people were asked, if you think of what you buy in the last three months, how many different animal welfare labels did you recall seeing in your supermarket, in the general retailer? And then you see green is more than one, uh, orange only one, known is the black part, and the light blue is don't know, I cannot recall at all. So if you see here, Greece, for some reason, there's more than half of the people uh, either didn't, didn't see any product with animal welfare friendly product, or the 23% don't even recall if they did it or not. So you can see all sorts of, of variation within the different nations of the, the 27 countries of the uh, European Union. Um, as you can see here, for example, this one is uh, a Swedish uh, uh, brand for animal welfare labeling. You can see the color of the, the, of the uh, Swedish flag, uh, blue and, and, and yellow. Oh, here, this is the Bienestar Animal Certificado is Spanish, and you can see the flag, the flag of Spain. Here, the flag of United Kingdom, uh, the flag of France, all these brands, the flag of uh, Switzerland, colors of Austria, white and red, and uh, you know, the orange and green and white, 
Ireland. So uh, the animal welfare labeling system could, in a way, help nationalization to, to, to do a, a promotion of the national product. So in a sense, could be not only uh, used as a, a mean to explain how the animals, uh, if, they, if the product uh, derived from animal welfare friendly practices, but also promoting uh, the nation, uh, the, the nation product itself. Uh, I don't know what did I did. No, 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 no. Here, maybe. Uh, yeah. Here you see uh, the study has analyzed uh, this uh, uh, around 50 logos. And out of these 50 logos, half of them, they were certifying the, the three uh, critical point of the, of, the, of the animal welfare, which is the uh, animal welfare in farm, animal welfare during transport and animal welfare in slaughter. So 26, nearly half, more than half, they were uh, related to the three phases of the production. Uh, four, only farm and slaughter, seven, only farm and then transport, and only 13, uh, they were uh, related only to the, product, the primary production, so were not related to the transport and the killing of the animals, only animal welfare on farm. Uh, here we can see uh, the distribution of the of the logo with the uh, with the, the three different segment of the production, like farm transport and slaughter. As you can see, uh, Germany has nine logos, four only farm, four uh, farm transport and slaughter. Uh, Portugal, for example, has got the three segment, only one. Uh, France has got two. So you can see the distribution, which is quite scattered. Spain, four uh, logos for the three segment and two for farm only, um, animal welfare scheme. And um, here we see the coverage of an animal's life by type of organization running. Okay, the scheme. Uh, this is important because it says uh, who is uh, responsible for the, for the scheme, for the logo. Unfortunately, uh, most of the, of, the, of, the, of the logos are run by the industry itself. So it's like, I mean, they certified more or less what they want, unless they have uh, strict controls on that. Uh, NGO, but fortunately we have um, like 14, NG, 14 logos that are certified by the NGOs, uh, five by the industry and public authorities themselves together, four between NGO and industry. So is, this is um, to explain what is the distribution of the, of the organization that's running the scheme. Here in this, uh, in this ch chart, you can see how many times a single species were mentioned in the scheme. Uh, of course, uh, quails, bison, deer, pigeons, geese are not very much represented because they are not very common. But the more you, know, the more you go up, you see fish 10 times, turkey 17 times, laying in 26 times, but the most represented species in, in this animal welfare friendly scheme are pigs. So the pig industry seems to be very, very much interested into this um, certification scheme. So to finish off, I will say uh, something about the consumers. So the, the, there is a need in, in, in the consumers want to have more information about their product. Uh, the variation between the different nations they do, do not replicate what do they have uh, as, uh, what do they perceive as animal welfare awareness. And there is a, a willingness to pay, uh, could be this willingness to pay an extra price on animal welfare product could be uh, augmented 
not only with new labeling system, but also with information campaigns. There is a very choose a very strong uh, interest in in the in in the population on to choose animal product based on animal welfare condition. They want to know about. I mean, public want to know again. Want to know what's going on in the farm, and they want to know if the animals are raised and animal welfare friendly or not. But uh, the interest they declare sometimes is not consistent with their purchase, purchase, purchasing behavior, meaning that they are, they are happy to know, but they're not ready to pay, or they are ready to pay less than organic stuff. So we have to think about this. This is an information that coming from the, from the, from the society. The society say, okay, we, want, we are ready to pay, but a little bit more, but not as much as we pay for organic farming, for example. Um, the ownership uh, in the management of the scheme can influence the whether uh, uh, the perception of, of, of the public, of the, uh, the trust uh, on the scheme. So it's very important that uh, the, in the, the whoever is going to be labeling and certify should be independent independent and should be reliable to the public and this is uh, could be another problem uh, and this concern i mean ngos seems to be the most reliable uh, mean to to transfer this information on the uh, final product um, also eu uh, could be itself but it's a complicated imagine to having I mean, it's not complicating because the, the, the logo of uh, organic farming logo is in a European logo. So it was, was decided and, and designed in Brussels. So maybe in the future, we will have a, 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 a welfare friendly logo that will be decided and, and, uh, and regulated by legislation at Brussels level. So this is very important for, 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 so at the end of the day, uh, the, the most important thing is that we are willing to, to pay enough, a little bit of extra price on the product, but not that much as we are already paying for organic farming. And this has to be taken into consideration when we're gonna do invest in animal welfare because animal welfare will take uh, investment, take money, and this money should be you know, paid off in, in in time with uh, on on the, on the product itself okay i finished myself thank you for your attention and uh, the last presentation will be tony and uh, i have to what do i have to do interrompi okay and tony yeah. how to develop a pro uh, protocol uh, example of uh, yeah animal. example of animal welfare scheme and will be the last one. I try to make it as fast as I could. So we have uh, half an hour more. And then uh, if you have any questions, we are here to answer. So Tony, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let's see some practical, a practical example of how uh, now okay sorry i didn't share it now okay now okay so this morning we saw what is animal welfare then i explain how we can develop a protocol on animal welfare based in 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 measures taken straight on the animals and now we will see some examples of these measures, how an animal-based protocol uh, could work, okay? And we will use the same structure that I explained to you before, the welfare quality uh, structure. So for principles, 12 criteria, we will go with criteria by criteria, checking what we can assess on the animals to assess their welfare. For instance, inside wood feeding, okay? Good feeding, a lot of protocols for good feeding, what they have is just to check the food that you are giving to the animals or even the feeders. Okay, how they are the feeders, where are the feeders, in which uh, state the feeders are. 
But in fact, when you are assessing animal welfare, this is just inputs, how the feeder is, how the food is. But you don't know how this impacts on the animal because you can have a very nice feeder with a very good food the day that you are visiting, but you don't know what happened one month ago. Or even, even in another example, you can have a good food during one month, during two months, but to have bad facilities and a lot of competition for this food in the animals. And then you have part of the animals that are, they are eating very well because the food is fine and the feeder is fine, but other animals just for a question of competition, they are not eating so good. And the only way to see how this is uh, going in the farm is to check in the animals and the body condition of these animals. So it's a good example of how when you are ass assessing incomes, you are assessing just the feeder, just the food. When you are assessing outcomes, how the animal is, you're assessing something like this, body condition. And it's funny, for instance, in body condition, the more thin animals and the more problematic animals usually are seen in extensive systems, more than intensive systems. Why? Because in intensive systems, especially for growing pigs, okay, if you have a problem with an animal, you will separate these animals and you will try to recover these animals because you are rearing pigs. You want to have fat animals at the end, it's your objective. The main objective of a farmer is to have animals with a good body condition. So in intensive systems, it's not so usual to find animals, especially growing pigs with bad body condition. In South is different. In South you can find sometimes some animals with bad body condition. But in extensive systems, it's more usual to see animals with bad body condition. Why? Because nobody's there. So if there is a lot of competition for food, there is few available resources, who is suffering this are the mass sumis animals in the, in the pen or the mass sumis animals in the herd. The animals that are in the end of the dominance hierarchy. And these animals are losing weight and weight and weight. And this happens in extensive. In dairy cattle is something similar. Okay, in dairy cattle, the body condition is a very important uh, indicator of animal welfare and, and of productivity. I will say you that most of the time, the farmers try to have the animals too thin in our farm. The farmer has the idea that if the animal is thin, it means that the animal is working well, it's, it's producing milk, it's fine, it's good. And it's true that if the, if the animal is too fat, the, the animal will not work. So this is true. This is absolutely true. But it's also true that if the animal is too thin, okay, these animals will have problems in the next lactation. And something more important, the future of this farm will have these problems uh, for a longer time. Why? Because that is very simple. When you have a very thin cow, in comparison to just a thin cow, very thin, in contrast to thin cow, the time that the calf after calving takes to a standing up can be more than the double. A calf of a good cow, it takes 20, 30 minutes to going up. A cow of a very thin, a calf of a very thin cow can take one hour or more. And this is a sign of how this calf is, how this calf was receiving energy from the mother. If this calf is a male, probably the problem will be for another farmer, not for you. That will be the one that will take this male and will try to make beef cut, beef, beef from this animal. But if this calf is a female, this calf will be your cow tomorrow. And nowadays we are, aware as of how important it is for any animal, including us as humans, the first stages of life, the first weeks of life can mark the development of the species for the rest of their life. And the big poppers of daily, not of animal welfare, the big poppers of daily production now, they are focused on the uh, how you say the new cows, okay? The cows, the young calves that will be our cows in the future, because most of the uh, 
Replacement, replacement cows. Yeah, yeah, this word. This is a word. Are focused in the replacement cows because this is the key, one of the key points for a good efficiency of the farms in the future. Because we are not taking care of these animals, and these animals are especially important when they are calves. And we are arranging a lot of problems that we will have in the future just if we are arranging the cows. And one of the problems is too thin mothers. One of the problems. So body condition is a good indicator of, uh, of how the farm is going on. Another one is good housing. In good housing, we have, for instance, comfort around resting. In comfort around resting, I, I will explain to you today only some examples of cattle and, and pigs. Okay, we have protocols for quails, for, for, uh, for laying hands, for turkeys, for a lot. But we will talk today about pigs and cattle and dairy cattle. So inside comfort around resting, for instance, one indicator is manual on the body. Manual on the body in pigs can show you two different things. If the animals that you have very dirty are the small ones in the, in the pen, it means that probably you have a problem of space allowance. Because pigs don't want to lie on feces. They don't like it. They are very clean animals. So they are, are trying to avoid this. If you see that the small ones in the pen are very dirty, the small ones are the subordinate pigs, it's because they don't have space in the resting area to be resting there. But you can go to the farm and you can see that you are the big ones that are very dirty. What's happening if the big ones are very dirty? It means that you have a problem of high temperatures. Pigs cannot sweat. So the way in natural resources in which they are losing temperature is to be wet just with the environment, just with the water, just with the mud that they find in the environment. In a pen, they don't have water, they don't have mud. So what they have, they have the feces. So they will go on top of the feces, they will take all the body of the feces and ah, they will lose temperature. Who will they do? The dominant, who is the dominant, the big one? So if the big ones are very dirty, it means you had the problem of temperatures. If the small ones are very dirty, it means that you had the problems of space allowance. If everybody is dirty, it's because probably you have a very dirty bed. <laughs> okay, so it's a good sign of how it's going in the farm. Another indicator is bursitis. Bursitis, you know, it's like when the liquid is going out from the joint, from the bursa. Okay, this is not painful, in fact, for the animal. Okay, except if it's extremely big, but it's not, it's, it's not painful usually, but it's an indicator of comfortability. Okay, it's when, remember when you were studying, okay, and you had the typical lessons of studying, okay, it means you are not comfortable doing this, okay, it's not painful, but it's a sign, okay, you could go to the, to, to the school and say, okay, this is studying, this is studying, and the other one, this is not studying, okay, it's not doing, uh, doing this. In pigs, it's the same, but depends on the floor. If the floor, for instance, on a slat floor in which you have a, a hole here, another hole here, another hole here, when the animal is all times resting on this, then it's producing this kind of uh, inflammation, this kind of bursitis. So you compare a group of pigs that were really done uh, on, on a slat and a group of pigs that were reared in, on, on a straw, and you see that the ones that are in the slat, all of them, are, of a 90% of the animals had bursitis and the animals that were in the straw, they don't have bursitis. And this is because we are talking about how comfortable is the floor where these animals are resting. So it's another animal-based indicator. For cow, for cow, it's very interesting to see how the animals are lying down and uh, going up. It's very interesting to see how the animal behave, how the farm is, etc. Why? Because these animals have 600 kilograms. You cannot improvise when you need to move 600 kilograms. So they are doing always the same movement in the same way. When they are going down, the first thing that you will see is that this leg is moving this way. This is the bias of say, okay, this animal will go down. Okay. And always the first part of the body that will go down will be the frontal area. And after the frontal area, they will go down and after there will be some movement. It's a very clear movement. If you see a normal movement as this one of here, 
that is an animal lying down as a dog, first behind, clack, sit it, and then this means that something is wrong with this animal. This is not a normal sequence. So something happens with this animal, first indicator. Second, if you see one animal that is trying to lie down, come on, come on, come on, and it's, it's another problem. It means that something is not growing. It's not going well in the farm. This is attempts to lying down. Too much attempts to lying down means that the, that the area is not comfortable for them. They, they, they are seeing something that is not clear. You see how many times it's okay. No, no. This means another time, how many times they takes to do all the movement. A cow takes from three to five seconds to do all the movement going down. Pim, pum, pam, clack, lie. And here, if the animal is touching the structures, we have a problem. The structures are there for the animals. If are disturbing the animals when they are moving, we will have a problem. So it's another indicator. If the animal is doing this in more than six seconds, we are penalizing in our protocol. An animal must go down in less than six seconds. It's not a big issue, it's, it's like laminis. How many animals are doing this in more than six seconds? If you have a high number of animals doing this in more than six seconds, it means that the facilities are not ready for these animals. And this is typical because it happens something very interesting with cows. The cows today are longer and taller than the cows 20 years ago. The Holstein typical dairy cows are bigger today than 20 years ago, but in most of the cases, uh, in most of the cases, our farm, our facilities are the same than 20 years ago. So the animals are touching the structures, the animals are not comfortable because the boxes that were working for the cows 20 years ago are not working for the cows that we have today because they are longer and they are taller. And this is another indicator. So in ease of movement, what we can assess tethered or not tethered animals, how many hours a day the animal is tethered, or they have access to a, to a pasture or just to an outdoor area or not, this is something that is, it can be assessed in dairy cattle as well. As uh, in this case, is more an income than an outcome. Thermal comfort, panting <laughs> due to heat conditions in peaks, very typical. In Spain, especially. Shivering when they are feeling cold or howling, the animals are one on top of each other. Why they are on top of one of each other? Because they are feeling cold. They are trying to maintain the body temperature is another good indicator. It helps as well the position of the animal when they are resting. You remember, pigs cannot switch, so how they are losing temperature by contact. So if I am feeling warm, what I will try to do, I will try to increase the contact with the floor, increase the contact with the air. I put an example sometimes when we are going to the beach. Okay, I, am, I, I, I was born 30, 30 meters from the beach. So I know bad, I, I know well this example. When you're going to the beach in May, for instance, a day as today, today is warm day, but it's windy. So you're going to the beach, you're going to the water, and when you are going out of the water, that you are wet and it's windy, you're feeling cold, and then you, you are in, in the towel, something like that. But after five minutes, when you are dry, you, are, you, you feel warm, and then what you will do, you will increase your surface, and you will put something like that. Oh, why to increase the surface of contact with the air, with the floor, to low temperature? This is something that is doing pigs as well. Where they are feeling warm, what they are doing, they are just lying in a lateral position to increase the contact with the floor, increase the contact with the, with the air, which is the problem, that this will interfere as well in the space allowance. Why? Because one peak of 100 kilograms lying in external position occupies 0 0.4 square meters. The same peak in a lateral position needs one square meter, the same peak. What happens that the European regulation is asking that for one peak of 100 kilograms, you will need 0.65 square meters. 
This means that more or less you accept that 30 percent of the animals can stay in lateral position and the other must stay standing up or in external position. What happens when you have warm conditions? What will happen is that you are producing a lot of competition for space inside your pen. So a pen that is working perfectly in winter with 12 peaks inside the pen, in summer, because of the temperature, is not working because there is too competition for the same space because the animals want to lie in a lateral position. And the dominant animals will lie in the lateral position, but the subordinate, no. And the subordinate animals will feel a lot of hot and then they will not eat and then they will lose a lot of body condition and then you will see that the big ones are very ones are very big and the small ones are very small another will another good welfare indicator the heterogeneity inside a pen when you have a very homo um, homogeneous weight in a pen it means that more or less everything is going well for everybody but when you have a lot of heterogeneity, what it means that you are putting the things difficult. And when you are putting the things difficult inside a pen, the ones that will suffer will not be the first one in the pen, no, no, will be the last ones. <clears throat> when you have a crisis in a society, the rich men will be richer and richer and richer. It's the middle class that is broken. And you see the middle class poor, the more poor, the more poor, 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 and poorest. This happens as well in a pen. As more competition for resources you will have in a pen, you will see that the middle class is broken and you have a big heterogeneity in the body size of the pigs. Because of that, because you will see who is the first, who is the second, who is the third, who is the fourth. It's very easy to see it. And this, and this is a, another good indicator on animal welfare. <clears throat> inside, inside absence of injuries, we have, for instance, wounds on the body. When they are fighting between them in pigs, Okay, it's not the same to have wounds on the body here in the frontal part that here in the back part. It's not the same. When two animals want to fight, they fight face to face. And they will mark all this part of here. And you will see a lot of lesions here. When one of the animals don't want to fight anymore, they say, okay, I don't want to fight. But if they don't have a space to escape, what will happen? The other one will say, hey, ka, 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 ka. and you will see a lot of lesions in the back part. Lesions in the back part means another thing, a different thing than lesions in the frontal part. Frontal part, the animals were fighting, probably because we were mixing animals. Lesions in the back part, the animal could not escape because of a lack of space allowance. Okay, it means different things. Animals walking, of course, as in cattle, okay, laminis. This is a typical moderate laminis, and this is a very severe laminis down. Difference between moderate and severe. Severe, the animal is not using the leg. Moderate, the animal is using a little bit the leg. Okay, laminis, another animal based measure. Let's move to the last one, appropriate behavior. I said to you this morning, we can't distinguish between positive social behavior and negative social behavior. What is positive? When one animal is touching another one and the one that is receiving the action is accepting this. Okay, it's nice. Okay, go it. This is a positive social behavior. And this is good. And you can say, okay, if we, when we have positive social behavior, it means that more or less all is going well. The problem is when we see negative social behavior. When we see that there is too much contact on the other one don't wants to be in contact or animals fighting. Or even worse than that, you have redirected behaviors like tail biting. And we'll see that the video is finishing with a case of tail biting. So behavior can, us, can help us as well. Expression of other important behaviors for the animals. Exploratory behavior in pigs, okay? When they don't have enrichment material or when they have enrichment material, that you can see big differences when there is a one not. <clears throat> Stereotypes, stereotype is a repetitive behavior that you can assess usually in, in adult animals. There is one typical in cows that is tongue rolling. 
that begin to do with the, uh, the, 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 the is typical in intensive systems. And in south, you can see something that is some showing hours. And sometimes with a movement with the lips, they make. I should have videos for this, but <laughs> stereotypes. Okay. <laughs> Repetitive behaviors. It's another animal welfare indicator that we can use. Of course, in cattle, we can use as well similar. We are, for instance, we have a protocol that we are two hours in the farms just checking social behavior in cattle. We will see here a displacement. A displacement in a, in a, in a dairy cattle farm is not a problem, one displacement. But when you see a lot of displacements, it means that the, something is not, is not going well. There is too much competition for resources. And one example is this video. Okay, when you see these ones, it's not a problem, it's typical. Okay, the animal is resting, it's a coming another one that is more dominant. Say, okay, come on, out. I want to stay here. Well, this is not a big issue. But if you are there 30 minutes and you see that this is continue happening, it means that you have a problem in your farm. You have, I don't know, 300 meters for the cows, but the house wants to stay just in 20 meters square. So you don't have 300 meters. You have 20. Why? Because there is a fan, because there is some windy there. I don't know why. You need to know why the animals want to stay there. But if you see a lot of competition for some area, okay, you need to provide these conditions in the rest of the farm, because if not, we will have problems. In cattle, the typical, typical, typical interaction is the head back. The head, well, come on, go. Okay, it's a typical, typical behavior. So you can check as well these kind of things or fighting behavior, okay? A fighting behavior between two cows begins, okay, always, well, I don't know if this is a video of fighting. No, this is headbutt, headbutt. Yeah, this is headbutt, but fighting behavior as well can be assessed in part of animal. Or, of course, positive social behavior, okay? Animals licking each other, this, is, this is, can be, this is usually, a, more seen in young animals, usually in beef cattle, young calves, or young, uh, uh, young animals before 12 years, 12 months old, that in, in older. In older cows, is, you can see it, but it's not so frequent. In young animals, you can stay there 30 minutes, and for sure you will see some of these movements because they are more uh, positive social. They are young animals, so they are looking for more contact. Then humans, the relationship with humans. We will see here a test that we are doing in South that is an approach test. First you see, okay, so I will come for you. And you are, you are there half a meter close to the cow. You wait 10 seconds and then you go down. You wait all 10 seconds and then you try to touch the sow. If you can touch the sow, it's a zero, perfect. If the animal is going out just after going, you are going down, it's a one. It's just when you are selling animal, well, I will go to you. The animal woo, is escaping. This is a two. This means that the animal is afraid from you. That I think is this case of here. Okay, the animal was here and you see that the animal is, is going, it's going, it's going. So this could be a two. In growing pigs, you can do something similar. And these videos are not very good, but in growing pigs, if you are going inside a pen, and when you are going inside, the pigs wah, are going all to the other side. And when you are right to them, wah, they are going to this side. This is panic. We are doing this in pigs of 100 kilograms. One group of pigs of 100 kilograms reacting as piglets of uh, 15 kilograms. It means you have a problem in the farm. Okay, in cows, we have something similar, a test that is an approaching test, okay? From two meters, you are going to the cow. If you can touch the cow, it's a zero. If you are moving to the cow and at two meters, the animal is going now, it's going, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a two. The animal is in panic. I used this to explain this to the farmers and I said, okay, do it with your personal. Take all your personal and make them to do this test. I explained how to do the test because you need to do a specific speed, so one step by second. 
you know, one one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, what's that? Should be okay. Not to not to see the animals straight onto the eyes, just to the muzzle, and to move in a very calm way. But if you are trained, this it takes two minutes to train people to do this. But then they can compare between between person and and, and, and sometimes people have surprises. I have three pe I think have three people. There is one that can touch 80% of the cows and one that cannot touch any one of the cows. The one that cannot touch any one of the cows, you need to say, okay, thanks, bye, don't, don't come tomorrow, don't come tomorrow. You are not good with my cows. They know who is good and not, they recognize people. Okay. In fact, there is there is a a funny history with cows in my case that there was when I beginning to go my my beer, okay, I I was to a farm and the animals I, I I stayed in this farm before, and the animals were very scared of me. And there was one of the personnel that was being a beer, and I said, take care with this one. And yes, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. It was uh, hitting the animals, crying. It was it was and really a disaster. And the animals, of course, they don't they don't recognize exactly the fishes, but they they recognize this and say, "Wow, this this can be as this one." So this test can help as well to assess animal welfare in a farm. And finally, in positive emotional state, we have a, a tool that is a QBA, that is something that is for twenty years working more or less well, that is an approach approach okay to the emotional state of the animals using a technique of with 20 adjectives it's something that the bats always we have done in the farm you arrive into the farm and you see oh today they are nervous oh today today i don't know or today they are very calm it's to try to do this in a more objective way in a more scientific way and it's something that is very interesting could be a qualitative behavior assessment and i was 20 years ago, I was very against this parameter because I liked the objective things, the scientific things, et cetera. And I didn't understand how we could use so subjective adjective to assess. But after 20 years, I can tell you that there is, there is a good correlation with other indicators of animal welfare. So it's something that it helps as well to have a general impression of which is the mental state of the animal, the, the, the reaction of the animal, to, to your presence in the farm. So this is, was just a taste of what uh, animal welfare protocol can be when we are using animal-based measures. And again, for third time, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we are finished. And um, if you have any question, uh, if not, I hope you to see you again sometimes in the National Congress, hopefully. In, uh, in July, in Belgrade. And uh, you all, you will be invited again. We are gonna have a, a, night, a big conference with more experts. Questions, not questions. Questions. Could we get the lectures? Say it again. The lectures, we get the lectures. No presentation. Yeah, I think, I think they will be providing some, uh, by email some. Okay. They are they are uh, as end out material for everybody who's willing to have it. Okay, Maya, we've just finished. Would you like to say something to the audience? You want to say something? And invite them invite them to the national congress. In July. Hvala vam puno što ste ostali do kraja. Ja sam malo izlazila, izvinjavam se predavačima zato što nam je Evropska komisija tu vrša kontrolu, pa sam onda malo na vezi sa kolegama. Sve vas pozdravljam. Kao što je Antonio rekao, ako je rekao, nisam čula. Izvinjam se ako se opet ponavljam. Znači imamo konferencije koje će biti održane u Beogradu malo 
masovnije i naravno bit ćete pozvani da dođete i drago nam bi nam bilo da se vidimo i tamo. Hvala vam još jednom. Hvala. And thank you again for your patience to be here up to the end of the meeting. Thank you again.